Chapter 15 Prepare to resist cavalry! The second rank of riders were discarding their lances, tossing them carelessly to the ground and drawing their firearms. The Cossacks had clearly expected the Redcoats to break and run as the line of powerful horses bore down on them. The Cossacks had turned fast, their even ranks as precise as when they first charged. The gaps in their formation had been closed, and their files were ordered, as if not a single rider had been knocked from the saddle. The cloud of rifle smoke had dispersed enough to give Jack a good sight of the enemy. Without command, the front rank of cavalry surged forward. Jack stood in the centre of the square, his attention focused on the enemy. He was aware of his men moving around him, the sergeants pulling at the ranks to force the men into a better formation, closing the gaps in the wall of bayonets, their industrious bustle steadying the men as they watched the Cossacks charge for a second time. He could sense his men's resolve, their determination hardening as they realised they had survived the first desperate moments of the fight. Jack was beginning to understand the confusion that swirled around him, making sense out of the chaos. His heartbeat slowed as he felt his confidence build. If the fusiliers stood firm, then the Cossacks were powerless to touch them. Commence firing, Jack ordered, his body flinching as the fusiliers discharged another storm of shot towards the Cossacks. This time Jack was prepared for the thick, pungent smoke and he turned on the spot, looking for a gap in the smog so he could watch the Cossacks thundering past in a repeat of their opening charge. He saw nothing but open plain. He twisted back round, pushing himself to the front of the side of the square that had faced the charging Cossacks, using his elbows to force a passage in the tightly packed ranks. The Redcoats' fire had been dreadfully effective killing men and animals with cruel abandon as the heavy bullets punched through flesh and bone. The front rank of Cossacks had borne the brunt of the punishment, screening the second rank of horsemen who now rode forward with calculated steadiness, each rider clutching a firearm. Jesus Christ, Jack swore aloud as he realised what was about to happen. Instead of being safe in their tight ranks, the redcoats were suddenly staring at death. When the second line of Cossacks closed the range, their firearms would not be able to miss the packed ranks. Every enemy bullet would find flesh. Stand firm and reload, Jack ordered, his heart contracting in horror as he waited for the inevitable. He caught Digby Brown's eye and saw the same terror reflected in his expression. The first line of Cossacks swung round, splitting into two groups that would attack the corners of the square, the weakest points in its formation. This time they would close slowly and use the long reach of their lances to stab down on the fusiliers. Reload! Jack screamed. Faster, damn you! The redcoats worked furiously, careless of skinning their knuckles on their bayonets, desperate to reload and drive the enemy away before they unleashed a storm of bullets of their own. As every second crawled by, the fusiliers got closer to being able to fire once more. Jack could not fathom the Cossacks' lack of fire, at any second he expected to feel his flesh being ripped apart, yet still the Cossacks did not fire. As the cloud of smoke from the fusiliers' volleys was dispersed by the freshening wind, Jack stopped screaming at his men and gaped. The Cossacks had gone. The light company stood in silence, the tension still swirling through the men. It took several long moments for the fusiliers' fingers to relax their grip on the trigger, a few seconds longer for the men to remember to breathe. Jack moved first, pushing through the shaken redcoats to stare at the Cossacks disappearing over the crest of the slope. The bastards! He was barely capable of coherent thought, such was the feeling of relief coursing through him. His two lieutenants came staggering out of the company to join him, the same mix of disbelief, astonishment and relief etched on their ashen faces. Lieutenant Thomas spoke first. What in the name of God was all that about? God is the right person to ask. Jack took a deep breath to steady his nerves. I don't have a bloody clue. Were they testing us? Who knows, replied Jack. Lieutenant Thomas struggled to cope with the wave of emotion coursing through him. Thank God. Thank God indeed. Digby Brown echoed with a withering glare at his captain. But 
Why do it? Thomas asked, his face now flushed with a rush of blood. Why did they not press home the attack? I rather think those fellows over there might have had something to do with it. Digby Brown waved his hand to the south. Jack looked up and immediately saw what Digby Brown meant. To the south, a full squadron of green-jacketed horsemen and a column of blue-jacketed troops flowed across the plain. The French army had arrived. The old enemy, Britain's most constant foe, the Crapos, had rescued the Light Company. The French cavalry galloped past, clods of earth thrown into the air, the ground drumming with the staccato rhythm of the fast-moving horses. The Cossacks rode away, driven from the field by the superior numbers of French cavalry whose bright yellow facings and gleaming sabres added a touch of the gaudiness to the miserable scene. Two companies of French infantry manoeuvred to take station on the light company's right flank. Jack's men began to deal with the aftermath of the fight, scraping shallow graves for the bodies of the Cossacks that had fallen. They paid little attention to their allies. The fusiliers worked in bitter silence, the grotesque evidence of the power of their minier rifles shocking the inexperienced soldiers. Their rescuers were no ordinary French soldiers, but the French elite, the Zouave. Originally formed of Algerian troops, the battalions of the Zouave had become something of a legend. The French authorities might have replaced the original colonial soldiers with true-blooded Frenchmen, but the regiment's reputation remained, as did their colourful uniforms. From their deep red, baggy trousers to the elaborate gold embroidery on their dark blue jackets, they looked as foreign as their name implied. A red fez perched elegantly on their heads, and bright white gaiters round their ankles completed their spectacular attire. A French officer strode forward jauntily, a smile spread wide under his thick black moustache. He wore a longer and more traditionally cut dark blue jacket with gold braided cuffs and epaulets. His red trousers were less baggy, with a thick blue stripe running down the seam, and a kepi replaced the more exotic fez. He looked a great deal less outlandish than the soldiers he commanded. A very good afternoon to you gentlemen, the French officer called out to Jack and his two lieutenants. I must apologise for our rude interruption. I rather think we spoiled your fun, no? The French officer's English was impeccable and bore only a hint of an accent. Jack was in no mood to be sociable. His indecision when the Cossacks first charged stung his pride. He should have had the men form a square earlier. His tardy orders had placed the company in danger when a more resolute and disciplined response would most likely have deterred the Cossacks from charging. His mistakes had nearly cost his men dear. You must excuse me, my manners are terrible. The French officer pronounced the last word in the French way, and Jack's mouth tightened with dislike. The French officer's own expression hardened, his eyes never once wavering from Jack's belligerent glare. I should introduce myself. My name is Octave Marceau. The Frenchman smiled an expression that sat well on his battered face, but which did not reach his hard, pale blue eyes. His face was lean, a large Romanesque nose dominating his features. A thin scar ran down one side of his jaw, and another smaller one flecked the cheek on the opposite side of his face. He looked as hard and as tough as his men. I have the honour of being a captain in His Majesty's 1st Battalion of Zouave. Both British lieutenants inclined their heads at the Frenchman's introduction, acknowledging his words as if they were meeting in more dignified surroundings than a muddy Crimean field. Sloams, Light Company, King's Royal Fusiliers. Jack kept his introduction short. Lieutenants Digby Brown and Thomas. He gave the briefest of nods towards his two subalterns as he introduced them. Marceau smiled politely. Those Cossack bastards... They think they can do whatever they like. I'm sorry my appearance drove them away. I should have liked to fight. We have uh, had enough of all this bloody waiting. The Frenchman smiled wolfishly. Indeed. Jack kept his reply non-committal, wanting the conversation over as fast as possible. You do not sound convinced, monsieur. 
Marceau's hard eyes bored into Jack's. Is there ever a good time to fight? The battle was too fresh to be casually dismissed. Of course, but you only fight when you know you can win. Jack heard the censure in the Frenchman's words. The experienced officer was admonishing the British captain's performance in the face of the charging Cossacks. We are British soldiers. We always win. Marceau smiled wryly at the bold claim. You British. If God had given you brains, then you would be truly dangerous. Jack let the comment pass. Another Zouave officer was standing, hands on hips, glaring in their direction, his hostility obvious even from a hundred yards away. Jack nodded towards him. I do not think your chum over there is pleased to see you fraternising with the enemy. Marceau looked across and snorted as he spotted his fellow captain's posture. Do not concern yourself with Saint-André. He hates the British. One grandfather died at Waterloo, the other at Talavera. He was taught to hate you roast beef since the day he was born. With a final bow, the French captain took his leave of the British officers and walked back to his men. Jack let him go, his thoughts returning once more to the disaster the Zouave had prevented. In a matter of days, the company was certain to face the Russian army. They could not always rely on the timely intervention of an ally to save them from destruction. They would have to depend on their officers to do that. Jack was painfully aware that his fusiliers would have little confidence left in their officers' ability. The knowledge humbled him. He had stolen a life and a rank that was not rightly his, and his lack of experience had nearly cost his men their lives. Chapter 16 Jack left the dismissal of the light company to Digby Brown. He had borne the men's despondency like a shackle round his neck during the weary trudge back to the battalion lines. The fusiliers had marched in a sullen silence, the confrontation with the Cossacks leaving them in no doubt about their captain's ability to command them in battle. Indecision costs lives, their lives. It was unforgivable. The Cossacks had outmaneuvered the light company with the ease of a vicious child plucking the legs from a captured spider. Jack's arrogant self-belief that he could lead a company into battle had brought him to this place. At the very first opportunity he had shown himself to be completely lacking in any of the skills needed for such a task. He truly was a fraud. Ah, Captain Sloams! Captain McCulloch spied his fellow company commander and called cheerily out in greeting. Jack was too despondent and too weary to reply, so he simply pulled his greatcoat tight around his body and waited to see what McCulloch wanted. He did not have to wait long to find out, as McCulloch's short legs propelled their owner across the muddy ground. Captain Sloams? Ah, oh, good, it is you. Bad news, I'm afraid. Still no tents. I cannot think what the commissariat are playing at. But still... No croaking, what? No one likes to hear a fellow griping on. We shall just have to make the best of it. Jack took in the news. No tents meant another night spent in the open, enduring whatever foul weather came their way. It was not news to lift his spirits. However, McCulloch continued when it became clear that Jack was not going to respond, we are told to expect a draft from the 2nd Battalion, Apparently they were meant to meet up with us back at Varna, but like most things, the army managed to lose them for a while. How many men? Jack's interest awoke at the news of reinforcements. I have not heard of the exact details. Are you short? Of course. But who isn't? I don't think there's a single company that's up to strength. Well, let us hope the draft is not just made up of raw recruits. McCulloch wrapped Jack's arm with the kidskin gloves he carried in one hand to emphasise the point. So, I hear your company was in action. He tried to steer the conversation towards the real reason he had sought out the light company's commander. Jack's brow furrowed. He was not surprised the news was already racing round the battalion. It was the first skirmish of the campaign and would be the talk of the brigade if not of the whole army. The battalion will be quite famous. We are the first to fight wasn't much of a fight. We formed square and drove them off. 
Jack was uncomfortable discussing the day's events. The company fought well, from what I hear. Jack grunted in reply, refusing to be drawn. McCulloch took the lack of a reply as a rebuke. Apologies, one mustn't harp on about such things. So let us hope the draft brings us fresh blood. He hid his disappointment well. Indeed. Jack struggled to shake off his apathy. I could use a new colour sergeant. Mine went down with the cholera before I even had a chance to meet him. Lieutenant Flowers did not say if there would be any such specimens in the draft, but you may be fortunate. McCulloch looked up as a few fat raindrops started to fall from the gloomy sky. We could all use some luck. Jack could not have agreed more. As he took his leave of McCulloch, the heavens opened. Jack sloshed his way through the muddy quagmire underfoot, lost in a gloom that soaked his soul in misery more thoroughly than the deluge could soak his bedraggled greatcoat. He prayed the new draft contained an experienced sergeant, a veteran soldier he could rely on to prop up his faltering authority. Jack knew he needed assistance if he was to bring his company through the battles that surely lay ahead. Jack shivered in the damp mist that heralded the arrival of dawn. A watery sun was rising slowly, ending another night of ceaseless discomfort and misery. The long and wretched hours of darkness had left them all weary, draining their already feeble reserves of strength. Jack, like his men, faced the dawn chilled to the bone, mud splattered and clammy, his body fatigued and aching. As soon as the battalion stood down, Jack ordered Digby Brown to organise the men into the necessary working parties ready for the quartermaster's instructions. Then, leaving his senior subaltern to manage things by himself, Jack squelched his way through the mud in search of Lieutenant Flowers, the battalion's harassed adjutant. Jack found Flowers perched on an ammunition crate, wrestling with three thick black leather ledgers, which Jack recognised as the company returns. It was a risk approaching the adjutant. Jack was well behind in the mountain of paperwork that the army expected him to keep up to date. His basic numeracy skills and dubious handwriting forced him to rely on his lieutenants to maintain the company accounts. He was not alone in his unwillingness to tackle the ledgers. Many of his fellow captains put a great amount of effort into avoiding coming into contact with the thick black books. The state of affairs drove flowers to distraction. The staff officers at brigade headquarters perpetually harassed him for correctly completed returns, which he could only provide with properly kept company ledgers. It was a never-ending battle between himself and the captains that Flowers knew he would never win. Nevertheless, the resourceful lieutenant did his best, and he would try any means to ensure some of the record-keeping was at least partially completed. The result was that any request made of the adjutant came at a price, a quid pro quo arrangement that had to be carefully negotiated. Jack arrived just in time to catch one of the ledgers as it slid from the adjutant's lap, grabbing it by the corner before it fell to a muddy grave on the filthy ground. Steady there, flowers. Jack gave the cover of the ledger an exaggerated polish with his sodden sleeve. He generally enjoyed a battle of wits with the adjutant. Flowers was quite the dashing young officer, and he sported a fine pair of whiskers that any cavalry officer would have worn with pride. By rights, Jack should have loathed him. Like Digby Brown, Flowers came from a wealthy family by the meagre standards of the King Royal Fusiliers, at least. His passage through the junior ranks had been effortless, as would the climb onto the next rung. But whereas Digby Brown carried himself with a precocious superiority, Flowers was charming, his easy company and propensity to share a joke smoothing any ruffled feathers among his fellow officers. He was impossible to dislike. Jack grinned at him. I cannot imagine Captain Devine would be happy to see his precious accounts ruined through your carelessness. Flowers greeted Jack with a warm smile. I believe Captain Devine would give a loud sigh of relief if I somehow contrived to destroy his company books. It's good to see you, Sloanes. Somehow we've managed to miss one another since we came ashore. Hard to believe, I know. It's as if you're avoiding me. Never. 
Jack tried to look suitably shocked at the preposterous idea as if he hadn't in fact ducked out of sight whenever he spotted the adjutant. I've been rather preoccupied preparing my company to fight. You are aware that we're about to fight the Russians, aren't you? Very amusing, Sloanes. Unfortunately, the staff officers at Brigade do not think this should interrupt my return, so I really would be very grateful if you could get your company's books in order. Then I will only have to make up around half the information Brigade is requesting. Well, you do such a good job of it. What does it matter if you make it up or if I tell Digby Brown to do it? The reason is very simple, as you well know. If you don't provide me with your completed ledger and I'm forced to guess, we may be left dangerously short of something we would rather like to have. Such as... Such as, uh... I don't know... New blankets or new boots or some other necessity we cannot manage without. Like... Tents. Exactly. Imagine how awful having insufficient tents would be in this godforsaken place. We don't have any tents, Flowers. You see, it's happening already. Perhaps if we had completed our records properly, we might have enough tents by now. No one has any tents. Not one. Not even General Brown. Then the whole damn army is probably guilty of incomplete accounting. I can't think of any other reason why we'd not be provided with the most essential equipment. Why, we might even run the risk of not having enough medical supplies or ammunition. Do we have enough medical supplies or ammunition? Now you come to mention it, that must be another item we have not properly accounted for, as we seem to have barely any. Good grief, Jack grimaced, his jocularity faltering. Very well, I'll get Digby Brown on the case. I even promised to help him spell the long words. You will? Flowers seemed surprised at such rapid capitulation. Capital! Is there anything you wanted to see me about? No, no, nothing at all. It was just a social call. I thought we'd not spent enough time together recently. Bosh! Well, since you insist, there is... One thing you can do for me. I was wondering if you knew the constituents of the draft that is due to arrive today. I do. What do you need? A sergeant. Preferably one with years of experience and a vast amount of patience. I see. Flowers placed the ledgers on another crate that had been pressed into service as part of his makeshift office. He carefully picked up a sheaf of papers that had been kept in place underneath his revolver, he flicked through the pile with the stained thumb before plucking one short scrap of paper from the middle. He ran his finger down the list. Forty-three other ranks, two corporals, and yes, you're in luck, one sergeant. I have no more information than that. Why are you so interested? Well, I only have three sergeants, and I have a feeling I'm going to need more than that. I was hoping you could see your way to allocating any new arrival to the light company. It may not be so easy. Flowers looked pensive. You're not the only one short, after all. McCulloch has only got two, as has Captain Taylor, and that's only because we gave Corporal Jones his third strike back. I'd plan to allocate him the new sergeant, as Jones is almost certain to get into another fist fight before the week is out. I'd be very grateful, Flowers. Flowers looked up from his papers. Something in Captain Sloam's tone caught his attention. As a rule, captains did not usually ask so nicely. I'll do all I can. Colonel Morris will have the final say, but I'm sure I can make it happen. Jack passed Captain Devine's ledger back to Flowers. My thanks, Captain Sloams. Jack turned and left the adjutant to his bookkeeping. Flowers watched him stride purposefully away. For the first time, he noticed that Sloams marched rather than walked his gait more regimented than the languid stroll of most officers. The commander of the Light Company was proving to be something of an enigma. He maintained a reserve quite unlike any of the other officers, as if he were hiding something of his real personality. Flowers pushed the thoughts from his mind. He had too much to do to waste time on idle reflection. He was satisfied to have succeeded in persuading at least one of the company's captains to sort out his paperwork. It usually took days of threats and cajoling, and more often than not the colonel's intervention to make any sort of headway. 
Flowers stood and placed the ledger Sloanes had handed to him neatly on top of the other two. As he did so, he noticed the name on it. It belonged to the light company. Sloanes had humbugged him. Chapter 17 The new arrivals trudged in late that afternoon. The battalion had spent another laborious day organising the mountain of supplies that continued to be brought ashore. Hour after back-breaking hour was spent moving the tons of supplies the army would need if it were to untie itself from the apron strings of the navy and strike inland. The arrival of new men would usually have brought the battalion to its feet to scrutinise the newcomers and subject them to a barrage of catcalls and insults. Today was different. The fusiliers were simply too exhausted after their day of labour to show much interest in their reinforcements. The newcomers, too, were in a wretched condition after weeks of being incarcerated on the transport ships. Many were raw recruits, naive, impressionable young men who had fallen for the blarney of the recruiting parties or were desperate to escape poverty, using the army as a refuge and a better alternative to the grinding misery of the workhouse. Most would have joined up in London, the Fusiliers' traditional recruiting ground where all manner of Englishmen, Scotsmen, Welshmen and the Irish could be found. A rare few would already be soldiers, volunteers from the regiment's depot companies who were drawn to the campaign to escape the mind-numbing boredom of garrison life. The new recruits would also include a substantial number of felons who had been given the option to serve the Queen. The authorities were always willing to empty the dregs from London's jails into the ranks rather than go through the lengthy process and costs of a formal trial. The army took them willingly, its insatiable appetite for manpower overriding any qualms about arming the country's criminal classes. The battalion would have to absorb these newcomers, embrace and train them, turning them from ordinary redcoats into fusiliers. This motley collection of soldiers stood about waiting to be welcomed. The sky had cleared, and the late afternoon sun did nothing to improve their appearance. A few fusiliers looked them over, a swift appraisal that invariably finished with a snort of derision. They were outsiders, foot soldiers, not fusiliers, therefore not worthy of consideration or attention. Lieutenant Flowers bustled over to greet the bedraggled replacements he had left waiting for close to half an hour. The adjutant was carrying several pieces of paper that he was trying to read as he walked. He paused to finish the last sheet of paper before tucking the pile under his arm and grinning warmly at the men who had the good fortune to be joining the King's Royal Fusiliers. Good afternoon, what glorious weather! And my apologies for the lack of ceremony, but as I'm sure you can imagine, things are a little busy round here at the moment. Uh, now then, I'll not detain you for long. We'll soon have you away to join your companies. Flowers noticed the enormous sergeant who stood alone at the head of the column. Goodness me, welcome. Sergeant, you'll be pleased to hear you are assigned to the light company. The best of the best for you. The sergeant snapped to attention. Sir. He was a bear of a man who would surely command the immediate respect of his new company. Flowers was certain Captain Sloanes would count himself very fortunate indeed. The lieutenant's attention was diverted for a moment by the sight of a most welcome surprise hidden at the rear of the column. Standing forlornly behind the formed ranks was a single horse and cart. Battered and broken, both had almost certainly seen better days and looked thoroughly clapped out. Nevertheless, Flowers was too delighted by the cart's contents to worry about its condition. God bless you, tents! It's about time they turned up. He immediately summoned the closest company to unload the cart's precious contents and haul the stone-coloured canvas sacks to where the rest of the battalion's stores were piled up. It was immediately obvious that there would not be enough of the large and cumbersome bell tents to go round, but on first inspection there appeared to be enough to get most of the battalion's officers under canvas, even if it meant some very cosy sleeping arrangements. The subalterns and the fusiliers would not be so lucky, and would be forced to continue enduring whatever weather the Crimean Peninsula chose to inflict upon them. 
With the unloading of the cart well underway, Flowers was pleased to spy the regimental sergeant major leading a gaggle of sergeants and corporals towards the sullen rank of newcomers. Flowers supervised the distribution of the reinforcements, handling the process briskly and efficiently, allocating the new arrivals to their allotted companies and into the care of the sergeants and corporals. Soon, only the new sergeant was left, along with the six men who would join him in the ranks. Sergeants Adams and Shepherd from the Light Company eyed the imposing figure of their new sergeant warily. Right, announced Flowers cheerfully. I'll escort you chaps to your new company personally. Follow me. Flowers found Captain Sloam's perched on the edge of a crate of ammunition. His feet stretched out lazily in front of him while he cleaned his fingernails with the end of a tortoise-shell comb. His shako lay discarded on the ground beside him, and for the first time the weather was clement enough for him to have removed his mud-encrusted greatcoat, which was draped over a stand of rifles in a vain attempt to dry it out. The captain's dress uniform showed the ravages of days spent in the field. The dress jacket was splattered with grime, the vibrant scarlet already dulled, and the bullion epaulets and fine brass buttons were tarnished and flecked with dirt. The uniform was slowly degrading in the harsh climate, much like the man who hid beneath its folds. Jack looked up as Flowers led his little procession towards him, casually tossing his tortoise-shell comb into his upturned shako as he stood to greet them. He had used the afternoon's decent weather to shave off his beard, something he never enjoyed doing. His skin was red and sore from the razor's abrasive attention, and a few spots of blood welled up under his jawline. At least the razor's blunt service had distracted him from fretting over whether or not he would obtain the service of a new sergeant. Now that concern came back, and Jack anxiously scanned the approaching men. With relief, he caught a glimpse of white sergeant's chevrons on the arm of the man following behind Lieutenant Flowers. Jack smiled warmly, and was about to offer his most profuse thanks to Lieutenant Flowers, when his smile died, and his body went rigid. Fear and loathing coursed through him, his fingers twitched towards the revolver at his hip. Flowers was bringing to the light company a man who could recognise the captain for the charlatan he was. Flowers saw the colour drain from Jack's cheeks. Captain Sloams, are you quite well? He moved forward and reached out to steady the visibly shaken officer in front of him, blocking the new sergeant's view of Jack. I'm fine. Jack spoke barely above a whisper, desperately trying to gather his fleeing wits. Are you sure? You have me quite concerned, but let me try to improve your spirits. The colonel has granted your request and let you take the new sergeant. I'm sure you'll find him of considerable value to your company, not least because the man is a damned Goliath. Flowers turned to one side and held his arm out to bring the replacement sergeant into the conversation. The towering soldier took a purposeful step forward and stood rigidly to attention in front of his new commanding officer. Jack stood face to face with the man he hated more than any other. His mind was racing, his memory replaying that brutal fight in the laundry. He could remember every bitter moment of it, and now the cause of all his misery stood in front of him, about to reveal his true identity. Slater was staring straight ahead, his gaze focused on a spot six inches above Jack's forehead. It took several agonising moments before the sergeant sensed that his new officer was waiting for his attention. Slater finally lowered his gaze. Jack saw the flare of recognition deep in the dark brown eyes. But the moment passed, and Slater's gaze returned to its original position. He stood rigidly at attention, his pose the very embodiment of a British sergeant waiting for a command. Right, I'll leave you to it. Lieutenant Flowers playfully punched Captain Sloams on the shoulder. Are you sure you're quite well? The last thing we need is you falling sick. There's been quite enough of that sort of thing already. Thank you, Flowers. You may go. There were a thousand questions running through Jack's mind as he struggled to understand how the brutal sergeant had arrived in the Crimea. There were many questions, but just a single conclusion. His charade was over. 
Chapter 18 The hastily erected tent already smelt musty, the gloomy interior thick with the stink of sun-warmed canvas. Jack stood back, politely holding the tent flap open so that his fellow captains could enter first. The darkness of the Russian steppe enveloped the British camp. The few flickering watchfires the men had managed to get started creating menacing shadows in the surrounding darkness. The army's pickets stared anxiously outwards, seeing danger in every shifting shadow, their nerves fraying, their fragile confidence eroding as the minutes of their duty ticked slowly by. The single tent would normally have been the temporary residence of one officer. Tonight, it would hold four. Jack would be sharing the small space with McCulloch and Captain Brewer, the commander of the battalion's grenadier company. The three captains would also have to find room for Major Peacock, the battalion's second-in-command, a proposition made all the more onerous due to Brewer's sizeable girth. It was traditional that the Grenadier Company was formed of the tallest men in the battalion, and many of them measured over six foot. Brewer was half a dozen inches shorter, but made up for his lack of height by being very, very fat. It would be a tight squeeze in the confines of the tent, but Jack appreciated how lucky they were to be spending a night with some shelter from the elements. The junior officers and their men would not be so lucky, forced to spend a third night exposed in the freezing night air. It was not lost on Jack that, as ever, the senior officers claimed the best of the scarce resources, their privileged lifestyle extending even to the furthest reaches of the campaign trail. Brewer carelessly tossed his shako, knapsack and scabbard to one side. He lowered himself awkwardly to the floor, the muddy ground covered by a creased and mildewed ground sheet, letting out an enormous explosion of wind as he did so. Unrepentant and ignoring the looks of disgust on the faces of his fellow captains, Brewer lay flat on his back and groaned in satisfaction. Do you know, this is the first time I've actually lain down since we came ashore. I'm exhausted already and we've yet to move more than a damn mile. Now, now, no croaking. McCulloch was carefully arranging his knapsack to one side of the tent, when it was lined up to his satisfaction, he unbuckled his sword and scabbard, which he placed meticulously alongside it, followed by his holstered revolver. He produced a handkerchief from his trouser pocket and laid this on the floor of the tent, then delicately sat down, using the crumpled linen to act as a barrier between the seat of his trousers and the soiled ground sheet. Jack watched McCulloch's fussy preparations with wry amusement before he slung his own knapsack onto the ground on the opposite side of the tent, following it with his weapons. He tossed his shako to one side and sat on his knapsack. A spasm seared up his aching spine and his hand automatically went to the small of his back in a vain attempt to massage away the worst of the pain. Curry! announced Brewer suddenly as he lay supine on the floor, his arms crossed behind his head. Nothing would hit the spot right now better than a curry. Curry? snorted McCulloch, who was rooting through his knapsack. Vile foreign muck. I've only had the misfortune to endure it once when I visited a cousin in London. Why anyone would want to eat such a loathsome concoction is beyond my powers of comprehension. Nonsense, man! Brewer scratched hard at his full beard. It may be a heathen food, I'll grant you that, but there are a few things better. Brewer lifted one hefty buttock as he broke wind for a second time. Excuse the old boiler. Now a good steak and kidney pudding might just win the day. Or perhaps a well-crafted game pie. Brewer was warming to his favourite subject. Sloan's care to venture an opinion? Jack started at hearing the name. His mind had been elsewhere, his thoughts dwelling on the return of Sergeant Slater into his life. He tasted the emotions that had stirred at the sight of the brutal sergeant. Hatred, fear, grief. Slater's appearance had brought back all the memories he had wished to hide away in the darkest recesses of his mind. Now they rose to the fore like the scum in an old keg of ale, bitter and sour for having been kept in the dark for so long. Jelly deals. Jack offered the suggestion curtly, attempting to convey his intention to stay out of the discussion. 
You have the taste of a costermonger. Jolly deals indeed now. Pie and liquor. That, I would understand, if you must indulge a fancy for the food of London's less salubrious parts. Or perhaps... The tent flap was violently snatched open, and Major Peacock stormed inside. He surveyed the interior of the tent with obvious distaste. His prominent Adam's apple bobbed up and down as he swallowed a mouthful of the ripe air. Peacock smoothed his razor-thin moustache with a thumb and forefinger. "'Goodness me, could you not have at least allowed us a moment's rest before you fill the air with your noxious flatulence, Brewer?' The Major immediately turned round to shout to his orderly who was hovering just behind him. "'Coffee, Spaulding!' he snapped. "'Bring it as soon as you have it, ready!' Peacock cautiously sniffed the air. "'I shall dine outside tonight.' Jack hid the look of distaste that crossed his face. Peacock represented much that he disliked in the officer class. Overbearing, bombastic, small-minded, ignoble and arrogant. Peacock was universally disliked throughout the battalion. To the men he was a bullying tyrant, an officer who gained immense satisfaction from his rank and his right to command. To his fellow officers he was unprofessional and discourteous. He enjoyed his position due to his constant toadying to Colonel Morris, the only man in the regiment who had not found cause to dislike the supercilious major. In peacetime, Peacock had thrived on the army's many rules and regulations, which he viciously enforced, ensuring that the lives of both officers and men were made as unpleasant as possible. Any misdemeanours were ruthlessly pursued, no matter how trivial. For the men, that meant punishment. For the officers, it led to a public censure and ridicule. The Major removed his shako and ran the palm of his hand over the bald dome of his head. Has no one given a thought to arranging some furniture? We cannot all be expected to sprawl on the floor, can we, Brewer? Peacock nudged him with the toe of his boot, which the grenadier captain chose to ignore. I can arrange something for you if you insist, volunteered McCulloch, a barely discernible hint of disdain in his voice. "'Good fellow, McCulloch. "'Then we can make ourselves as comfortable as the circumstances will allow.' "'McCulloch rose to his feet, "'and Peacock made a point of clapping him on the shoulder as he left the tent. "'You see, Brewer, not everyone is as slothful as you. "'You really should follow McCulloch's example "'or even take a leaf out of Sloanes's book. "'He has already engaged the enemy "'while you, lazy good-for-nothing that you are, "'lumbered around the battalion cadging food.' "'I resent that, Peacock,' Brewer said mildly, refusing to be drawn by the Major's hectoring. Traditionally, officers addressed each other by name rather than rank when they were not in front of the men. Colonel Morris was the only exception. He was only ever addressed as Sir or Colonel. "'My grenadiers are in tip-top condition, as we shall prove when we finally get off our collective firmament and take on the damn Ruskies.' Bravo, Brewer, bravo. Outer winkery, outer more. That's the spirit. What do you say, Sloanes? Jack did his best to look composed in the face of Peacock's schoolboy Latin. He had no idea what it meant. The knowledge of ancient, long-dead languages had been lacking in the rudimentary education that he had received from his mother. Yet for an officer, it would be unthinkable to have no knowledge of it whatsoever. His usual tactic of hiding his lack of education behind a curt reply would not deflect someone like Peacock. What do you say, man, to conquer or to die? I'd sooner do the conquering than the dying, Jack replied with more honesty than he intended, something he was immediately made to regret. Come now, Sloanes. Deficit omne quod nasiture. Surely it's better to die gloriously than to live your life in the shadows and die wondering what you could have achieved if only you were dead to live a little. Key our date, our dispisatory. Jack had a fair idea that dying gloriously meant having your body shredded, your insides spilling onto the ground while you writhed in unimaginable agony, an opinion he felt sure the Major would not take kindly to hearing. Fortunately, he was saved from having to reply by the timely return of Captain McCulloch, who came into the tent followed by half a dozen fusiliers carrying an assortment of ammunition crates and ration boxes. It's the best I could find. McCulloch announced. At least we shall have something to sit on. 
The private soldiers deposited their burdens and scurried out of the tent, each man keen to avoid being given any more unwanted errands. Peacock perched on the edge of one of the crates and looked round at his companions for the night. All were avoiding his eye, busying themselves with routine tasks or, in Brewer's case, simply lying in an exhausted stupor. Peacock sniffed in disapproval. None of the captains was offering him any sort of entertainment, so he determined to make his own. Well then, I trust you and your companions are ready for the off. Peacock spoke far louder than was necessary. He was pleased to see Sloams look up from cleaning his revolver while McCulloch sat down on a crate and appeared to be giving him his full attention. Brewer gave no sign of having heard him, but Peacock was reasonably certain that the captain of Grenadiers would be listening if he were not already asleep. The colonel and I have been told we should be ready to move in a day or so, Peacock continued. The French are eager to move inland as early as tomorrow, but Racklin will not let us go until he is satisfied that we are ready. Quite rightly, the general does not intend to allow us to be ordered around by that decrepit old crone Saint Arnaud. Racklin will not order an advance until he is certain that we have adequate supplies. I expect that is something he learned from the old duke. Peacock spoke confidingly, as if Raglan had offered the opinions to him personally. It was typical of Peacock's conceit to speak in such a self-important manner. Jack went back to cleaning his revolver. McCulloch, however, was intrigued. I wonder why the French seem so much better prepared for the campaign than we do. Their soldiers have their own tents, the army is well served by a commissariat, brought with them from France and they have more than enough transport, having brought that with them too. They even have a number of those newfangled ambulances to move the sick. I'm sure the general has everything in hand, Peacock disapproved of McCulloch's negative comments. It would never dawn on the Major to think ill of his betters, even if their incompetence was staring him in the face. I'm not croaking, merely observing that our allies seem a great deal better prepared for the campaign than we appear to be. Uh, per aspera ad astra, McCulloch, I admit we may not appear to be as prepared as our allies are. However, remember this. A Frenchman cannot survive for two minutes without his comforts. They are a nation of dancing masters. We British, on the other hand, function far better when confronted with adversity. Jack gave up the unequal struggle to remain silent in the face of Peacock's crass comments. What utter claptrap! I have yet to find a soldier who fights better when he is wet and exhausted. Are you, are you seriously saying that driving the men to breaking point is part of some grand strategy? Sleums, cave quid decis quando et qui? I cannot and will not tolerate such talk. Jack may not have understood Peacock's Latin, but the message was clear. He rebuked himself for getting involved in such pointless pontificating. Slater's arrival had shaken him to the core, and he was letting his carefully constructed character slip. My apologies, I did not mean to sound disrespectful. I'm sure our commanders are fully in control of the situation. Peacock was not about to let him off the hook so easily. This was just the kind of entertainment he had hoped the officers would provide. I would remind you, Sloanes, that you are a captain in one of the finest regiments in this army. You hold a position that comes with onerous responsibility, a responsibility that requires you to set an example to the officers and men under your command. Peacock was enjoying himself. This was the first time he had been given an opportunity to give the captain of the light company a dressing down. He gave every impression of being a capable and competent officer, but the man kept himself to himself far too much for Peacock's liking. He needed to be reminded of his place in the battalion's pecking order. As officers, we must maintain a character that is without blemish, Peacock continued. A character nulli secundus. Without it, you will be unable to command the respect of the men. Respect, Sloanes, you must earn respect. It is not given freely. The men are the scum of the earth, as the late Duke so eloquently put it. Without gentlemen to lead them, they are no more than a rabble. Jack bridled at Peacock's words. The men are not scum. If you only took the time to get to know your bloody command, you would know that. Of course, that would mean taking your head out of your own arse first. Sloanes, McCulloch cried out at Jack's outburst. 
Even Brewer was shocked enough to push himself to his elbows to stare at the source of such a scandalous eruption of anger. The reaction of the two captains was as nothing compared to Peacock's outrage. Sloams had barely spoken in the weeks since joining the battalion. The sudden transformation was startling. How dare you, Peacock shouted. The colonel shall hear of this. He rose to his feet, and so did Jack. It looked as if the two officers would charge at each other. McCulloch leapt up, physically interposing himself between the two officers who continued to shout at each other. Jesus Christ, what are you going to tell the colonel? That I dared to speak the truth? Jack no longer tried to hold back the flood of emotion that surged through him. He felt the charade that shackled him fall away and was glad of it. Why, you devil! I am your senior officer and you will speak to me with respect. Respect? Jack spat the word out with venom. Respect has to be earned, remember. I have no more respect for you than I do for the fleas in a whore's drawers. Peacock was dumbstruck. His mouth hung open as he tried to speak through his fury. He was not silent for long. You swine! Never have I been spoken to like that, never! You viper! There is no place for scum like you in the King's Royal Fusiliers. I shall see to that. Out of vium in vanium, out of facium. When the colonel finds out about this, you will be damn lucky to keep your commission. If you were a private soldier, I'd have you flogged until I could see your spine and... Alarms! To arms! To arms! The call to arms resounded through the army. Something had stirred in the darkness of the Russian steppe, scaring the already nervous sentries and triggering mayhem. To arms! To arms! Men scrambled from their bivouacs. Redcoats rushed to find their weapons. Officers came, stumbling from their tents, undressed and unprepared. Sergeants rapidly formed their men into some kind of rough order before their officers dragged them off to where the line of pickets had begun firing into the night. Chapter 19 Peacock stormed out of the tent as the alarm sounded. Jack would have charged after him, nothing now left to lose, his charade about to end in a blaze of scandal that would see his name go down in the folklore of the battalion. But the threat of an attack was very real, and despite everything... His duty to his men and to his regiment came first. Jack bent to reassemble his revolver, ignoring the tension that filled the tent and refusing to acknowledge either of the astonished captains who had been struck dumb by his outburst. Brewer was the first to recover his wits. He levered himself to his feet, exhaling loudly with the effort, and hurried out of the tent with a sharp look of reproach at Jack. Brewer might have treated Major Peacock with less reverence than his rank was due, but that did not mean that he would ever condone the loutish behaviour and foul-mouthed abuse he had just witnessed. McCulloch let out a long sigh, shaking his head at the distressing scene he had just witnessed. What came over you, Sloanes? What possessed you to speak to Peacock in such a... McCulloch struggled to find the right words... Such an appalling manner. Jack looked up as he snapped the last parts of the gun back together, his expression grim. It's no more than he deserved, and I damn well enjoyed it. Enjoyed it? You perverse lunatic, you cannot speak to your superior officer like that. You heard the pompous fool. If anyone is playing the fool, then it's you, not Peacock. He'll drag you over the coals for this, you dolt. You'll have to apologise. Apologise? I'd rather rub my ass with a brick. Please, refrain from using your foul language with me. You'll have to apologise or you'll face ruin. Jack chuckled at the threat. We're about to fight the biggest bloody battle since Waterloo. What punishment can Peacock possibly inflict that is worse than what the Russians have in mind? Worse? Why, he could ruin you. Don't you understand? He could blacken your reputation so that no other regiment would ever accept you. You would never live it down, never. Your career would be finished. Reputation. Is that all you lot really care about? What a load of pompous claptrap. Jack felt his anger returning. What on earth do you mean, you lot? 
As officers, we are nothing without our reputation, and without us, the men would never fight. Is that right? Oh, I forgot. The men are just scum, and it takes a true gentleman to be an officer and lead them. Jack fired back, his face taut with anger. Of course it does, and well you know it. I know no such thing. You're being as much of an ass as Peacock, if you believe it. McCulloch stepped back as if Jack had physically hit him. Jack thought McCulloch might actually strike him, but although he was shaking with anger, he managed to bring his rage under control. You are a fool, Captain Sloams. A fool and a viper. Peacock was quite right. I only wonder how you kept your true character hidden for so long. McCulloch snatched up his weapons and strode out into the night. Left alone, Jack stood still, savouring the momentary peace. It seemed to him that his imposture lay in tatters around him in the tent. Yet he felt no fear, only relief. Giving up the deception was perversely liberating. He thrust his revolver into his waistband and snatched his sword and scabbard from the ground. He would face the Russians and do his duty. Peacock, McCulloch, Slater and the rest of the bloody officers could go to hell. He whipped back the tent flap and strode out into the chaos of an army on the verge of panic. Soldiers ran in every direction in complete disorder, some armed, some seeking weapons, everywhere a frenzy of movement and sound. The bellow of orders and counter-orders, shouts of confusion, the jangle of equipment and thud of booted feet resonated in the night. Through it all came the sound of gunfire. Sometimes it rippled out like a child running a stick along an iron fence. Then it would die down to single shots, before the noise built to another crescendo as more soldiers fired at shadowy targets in the darkness. A vicious blow smashed into the side of Jack's head and sent him reeling back into the tent, knocked half-witless. The attack had come out of nowhere. He desperately tried to locate the source, but his vision was blurred and his senses dazed. The second blow came in low, punching into his stomach, driving his breath from his body. He doubled over, unable to recover, incapable of doing anything but absorb the blows that came out of the darkness. As his head went down, his attacker threw his knee forward, connecting with Jack's unprotected face, snapping his neck backwards and throwing him onto his back. Jack hit the ground, agony searing through his body. He could feel the blood running freely down his face from his battered nose, with more filling his mouth where his lips had been driven into his teeth. Before he could even begin to struggle, a huge body thumped down on top of him, pinning him to the tent floor. Barely able to breathe, Jack tried to raise his arms, but his opponent merely punched down, sending another searing lance of agony into his already battered face. His arms were thrown backwards and pinned underneath his attacker's knees. Pain seared through his arms and shoulders as his assailant leant his weight forwards, bearing down on him. He was helpless and barely conscious. Wake up, damn you! Jack's assailant hissed through gritted teeth, leaning over his face. Though the pain was terrible, Jack forced his eyes open and looked up into the terrifying gaze of Sergeant Slater. Good evening, Lark. Even dressed as a Rupert, I knew it was you. Spittle flew from Slater's mouth, mixing with the blood that covered Jack's face. I thought I must have been dreaming. But there you were, bold as brass, and looking quite the part, I have to admit. Slater leant so close that Jack could smell his fetid breath. You almost had me. You seemed so at ease, like you truly were an officer. So I didn't say anything. I needed some time to think. But when this little shindig kicked off, I thought it was too good an opportunity to pass up. So, here I am, come to say hello to my old chum, Jack Lark. Jack could see every pore on Slater's sweating, florid face. Fuck you, Slater! Slater cackled, showing the blackened stumps that were all that was left of his teeth. I'm going to kill you, Slater. You hear me? You're going to pay... Slater swatted one meaty hand across Jack's face, cutting off his words. 
The blow sent droplets of blood splattering across the floor of the tent. Enough. Slater looked down at Jack. He was as calm as could be. I must hand it to you. I never knew you had it in you to be so daring. Oh, I admired you for standing up to me. That took real guts, that did. But when you and that fool Sloan scuffled away, I can't say I was surprised. His face creased into a smile. What did you do with Sloan's? Did you kill him? He died. Slater nodded solemnly. So, Sloan's died. That was convenient, wasn't it? Then you pinched his uniform. But coming out here was plain stupid. It's going to be bloody dangerous in these parts soon enough. I had nothing left. You saw to that. You sad little fool. Slater seemed genuinely amused. Then his expression hardened. I lost my colours and got shipped out to this rat hole because of you. His face twisted. That fat fool Stimpson said I brought the regiment's name into disrepute and had me sent away. Just because that stupid doxy banged her bloody head. The huge man shook his head. But now I reckon things will turn out all right. This is quite a nice little swindle you've got going here. I'm almost proud of you. Slater cackled at the notion. From now on, you do what I tell you, or I'll gab on you and let the army hang you for the fake you are. So, you make life nice and easy and do what you're told. He paused as he let the threat sink in. Now then, I'm going to stand up and there's no need for any fuss and nonsense. Just take it easy and think on what I said. Slater eased his weight cautiously backwards, releasing Jack's arms, ready for any sign of resistance. He need not have bothered. Jack lay immobile, his pain-racked body unable to move after the beating. Slater eased himself onto his haunches, giving Jack a cruel smile as he did so. I knew you'd see sense. Now you lie there like a good chap while I walk my chalk. We'll have another chat on the morrow, and remember, I'll be watching you. Slater pushed himself to his feet, watching Jack warily the whole time. Jack could do nothing. He could not even force his bruised arms to move. He closed his eyes against the pain, holding them closed for several long seconds. When he finally opened them, Slater was gone. Gingerly, Jack tried to sit up, his body protesting loudly. His arms felt crushed, as if the muscles had been pulped while his face was a single orb of pain. The months had not diminished Slater's ability to deliver a slating. Jack slowly forced his body upright, meeting every fresh lance of pain with a stream of expletives. He staggered across the tent to his kit, the act of bending down to open the knapsack, releasing another flurry of oaths as sharp needles of pain surged through his back. Clutching the scrap of linen he'd used to clean his revolver in one hand and his canteen of water in the other, he lurched painfully out of the tent, grateful for the darkness that would hide his battered features from casual scrutiny. The first thing he noticed was that the rifle fire had died down. Then he realised that the fusiliers were streaming back into the battalion lines, their eyes bright with the excitement of blasting the night air with their minier rifles. The British soldiers had been shooting at shadows. The Russian army was safely tucked up in their tents and in the cosy houses of Sebastopol. There was no attack. The alarm had been false. Like revellers returning home from the local fair, the fusiliers were laughing and joking with each other, their exhilaration obvious even through Jack's blurred and pain-filled vision. Keeping his head down, Jack slowly made his way through the men the only thought to seek out a refuge where he could tend to his wounds away from the prying eyes of his fellow officers. He skirted round the bigger groups of redcoats, walking as briskly as his injuries would allow, hoping that the men's excitement would allow him to pass through them unremarked. Jack spotted a gap between the last of the officers' tents and a column of empty wagons. The small space offered a sanctuary away from inquisitive eyes. He was so intent on reaching his goal that he did not notice a burly redcoat come hurrying out of the officer's tent closest to the carts. 
The soldier barged into Jack, and for the second time that night he was knocked to the ground. Jesus Christ, sorry, I didn't see you there, mate. Tommy Smith reached out a hand to help him to his feet. As he did so, he realised that he had knocked over an officer. Blow me! Oh, sorry, sir, I didn't see you, I swear! Oh, sweet Jesus! A fusilier could find himself flogged for knocking an officer off their feet, even accidentally, something that Smith was well aware of. Oh, my God! he exclaimed when he saw the officer's injuries. The man looked terrible, as if he had fought the Russian army on his own. Blood was encrusted around his nostrils and caked around his bruised and swollen lips, and the imprint of a hand was clearly visible on his right cheek. Smith kept a firm grip on the officer's arms, as it was obvious that he could not support his own weight. It was only as the officer wearily lifted his bloodshot gaze that Smith recognised the battered features. His eyes widened in shock. I've got you, sir, I've got you. Let's sit you down, sir, before you fall down. Grimacing with the effort of supporting Jack's sizeable frame, Smith gently lowered his officer back to the ground, sitting him down so that his back was leaning up against one of the wagon wheels. There you go, sir. Now let's have a look at you. Jack hovered on the brink of unconsciousness. Through the fog of pain, Jack recognised the square-jawed face of his orderly. Sorry, Tommy, I'm a bit of a mess. Jack's swollen and bloody mouth made his words barely intelligible. That you are, sir, that you are. Now then. Smith's thick fingers gently prized the cleaning cloth and canteen of water from Jack's grip. Let's clean you up so we can see the damage. Just sit tight. Jack let his head fall back so that it was resting on a spoke of the cart's wheel and submitted to his orderly's administrations. For a farmhand, Smith was surprisingly gentle, his deft movements efficiently removing the worst of the blood. As Smith worked, Jack nurtured his hatred for Slater, using it as a balm for the wounds to his body. He had stolen Captain Sloane's identity and gambled that he could make a new future for himself. Now his past had caught up with him, and that bastard of a sergeant held all the cards. Chapter 20 There you are, sir. Best I can do. Smith stood at last, his knees cracking as he did so. He looked at his captain where he lay slumped against the cart's wheels. Smith thought he had lapsed into unconsciousness, but eventually one eye partially opened. Thank you. Jack could not raise the energy to speak above a whisper, but Smith heard the softly spoken words. What happened, sir? It looks like you went ten rounds with a backstreet prize fighter. I fell. Jack's voice was still thick with phlegm mixed with blood, and he spat a fat globule onto the ground. Trip over one of the damn guide ropes. Smith snorted at the obvious lie. Nonsense, sir, if you'll forgive me for saying so. I know a slating when I see one, and I can see some bugger has used you for a punch bag. Jack looked at his orderly. Pain and tiredness threatened to overwhelm him, and he craved respite from the fear of his impending doom. Peacock hated him, and would surely make it his business to bring about his disgrace. McCulloch and Brewer likely felt the same. Then there was Slater, revelling in his discovery and certain to make the very most of his knowledge before leaving Jack to face the consequences of his imposture. Jack felt very alone. Slater. The name was out before he had finished thinking, the first drop of water through the crack in the dam that was on the brink of collapse inside him. What? Smith barely heard the name. He sensed his officer was wound tight with tension. He did not try to speak again. Instead, he lowered himself to the damp ground so that he sat alongside Jack. Slater. Slater beat me. He knows who I am. Smith opened his mouth to speak, but he was too confused to form a coherent question. He remained silent and waited for his battered captain to explain himself. 
Jack gingerly turned his head so he could look at the effect his words were having on his orderly. Smith's close presence was reassuring, reminding him of the times when he would sit among his mates after a hard day's drill. Slater knows who I really am. He knows I'm Mudlark. God, of all the damn men, why did he have to come here? Jack was rambling, his aching brain making heavy weather of stringing sentences together. Excuse me for asking the bleeding obvious, sir, but who the hell is this mudlark? I am. Uh, you're not making any sense at all, Captain Sloan, sir. No. For the first time in a long time, I'm making perfect sense. Jack painfully lifted his arm and offered his hand to the bewildered fusilier. Jack Lark, pleased to make your acquaintance. Sir, Smith frowned, what are you talking about? I'm an imposter. We're of the same kidney, you and I. Look behind the gold and the scarlet and I'm just the same as you. Smith started to push himself to his feet, clearly uncomfortable to be having such a conversation with his captain. Stay where you are, Smith. Jack gave the order with the snap of an officer and it immediately stopped his orderly in his tracks. You see? I'm bloody brilliant at playing the officer. Now sit tight and listen so you'll be able to retell the story in full. You'll be quite famous. The orderly of the scandalous Jack Lark. You could well drink off the tail for the rest of your life. Jack took a deep breath, causing his ribs to protest. I was an orderly, just the same as you. In truth, you could say we have both been served the same officer. My officer was called Captain Arthur Sloanes. He died, God rest his soul, leaving me alone in the arse end of nowhere. What I should have done was carry the damn corpse back to the army and let them pack me off to some place new would have been simpler, but I couldn't bear the thought of joining a new regiment on my own without my old mates. Jack paused, tentatively inspecting the tattered ribbons of flesh on the inside of his lips with his tongue before continuing. I could have deserted, I suppose. Used the opportunity to take myself off and forget the whole damn army. But, more fool me, I like being a soldier. So, there I was, presented with the chance to stop serving an officer and to actually become one. To be a captain, something someone like us could never even dream of becoming. I even thought I'd be better at it than half the fools got endowed with enough damn money to be able to buy their rank. Jack had to stop himself. The pain in his head was increasing as he became more agitated. So, I stole a life. Jack eventually continued when the worst of the pounding in his skull faded away. Jack Lark died and Arthur Sloanes lived again. I became Captain Sloanes and not one of the bloody useless clots we call officers ever questioned me. The fools never suspected a thing. It's no wonder this army is a shambles. The bloody idiots couldn't even spot a fraud as damn queer as me. Then Slater turned up. Jack paused to see how Smith was reacting but the fusilier was just staring into the darkness. Now, he truly is a bastard. He knows me from my old battalion. Jack's speech trailed off. The talk of his past had reawakened the pain of Molly's death. He wanted to thrust it away, to deny its presence and with it Molly's place in the story of his imposture. He let his head fall forward so his chin rested on his chest, his bitter grief threatening to overwhelm him. The silence stretched out. Around them the battalion was quietening down. Jack could make out the shadowy forms of the officers in the tent next to where he sat, their silhouettes picked out by a single candle. It was like watching a puppet show at the fair. Their braying laughter sounded loud in the dark, and Jack was heartily relieved to be away from the bombastic company of the battalion's officers, even if it meant sitting on the damp soil, beaten, bruised and exposed to the elements. Finally, Smith spoke. We're a pair of rummy coves, all right? He chuckled softly to himself. Jack looked at him. What's so funny? You! Me? You think you're some great villain, some scandalous cove who has committed a daring crime that will shock the whole army? Haven't I? Come off it. 
Half this damned army is pretending to be someone they're not. Most of us would be in the clink or been packed off to the colonies if we'd not taken the Queen's shilling. You think being an imposter makes you special? But like the rest of us, you're just trying to stay one step ahead of the rich who piss on us without a second thought. Smith's casual dismissal of his crime needled Jack. So, what's your story, Smith? What makes you such an authority on the low life in this army? You seem to know a lot about it for an honest country bumpkin. I'm a thief, Smith said quietly. The word hung between them, silencing them both for a while. Jack swallowed. What did you do? Anything, really. Bit of this, bit of that. Hoisting stuff, bit of the panny, passing queer screens, anything to earn some bloody money. Till I was nabbed, that is. Serve the Queen or go to bloody Botany Bay, that's the choice they gave me, so here I am. You're a charlatan, I'm a thief, proud redcoats all. Jack suddenly recalled where Tommy Smith had been when they had collided. You're still at it. You're still a bloody thief, a regular Jack Shepherd. Of course I am, you fool. Why else do you think I wanted to be an orderly? Do you think I wanted to feed some toff his victuals or clean his shitty drawers? Smith saw the growing look of horror on Jack's face. Oh, don't worry, I didn't pinch anything of yours. Just don't you go raising a shine when Lieutenant Price croaks about losing his precious bloody pocket watch. You scoundrel. Well, you were right. We're both of the same kidney. No, we're not. You're a bloody thief. Jesus Christ, what are you then? I just pinched stuff. You stole some poor sod's whole life. The sharp comment hit home. Jack had never considered himself a thief. In his own mind, his charade had been a way of doing his duty, of serving his queen and country by making the most of the abilities he knew he had. Smith saw it in more simple terms. So where are you from, Jack, if it ain't Hampshire or some other place where all the posh folk live? London. Whitechapel. No wonder your life's all messed up. What about the poor bastard who died? What about him? What about his family? Jack's brow furrowed at the unexpected question. He had never given Sloanes' family much thought. He has a much younger sister. I don't think they were close. He didn't mention her much. So she thinks he's still alive, then? Maybe one day you can find her and tell her what happened. Jack chuckled at the thought, something he immediately regretted as the laughter magnified the pain in his skull. I doubt she'd be happy to see me. Oh, you'd be surprised. Women love returning heroes. Maybe you can even go and visit your ma one day. If she hasn't drunk herself to death yet. Like a tipple, does she? You could say that. She runs a gin palace. You left a ginny to join the Redcoats. It's not as good as you think, believe me. I near broke my damn back in the bloody place. It was full of drunks and whores and piss. Sounds like my idea of heaven. Then you're a fool. Smith snorted at the notion. So where was your governor while you were having such a horrible time of it getting pie-eyed with your dear old ma? He ran off with a whore when I was a nipper. So at least someone in the family had some sense then. Not really. He was found in a gutter a week later. The bitch had slit his gizzard and disappeared. Sounds like a nice place, your white chapel. Remind me to steer clear. Wasn't so bad. The one good thing I remember was the recruiting party that came by once a month. I used to watch them as they gulled the local lads into taking the shilling. I thought those soldiers were the finest men I had ever seen. They were so clean and smart, and you should have heard the stories they told. I couldn't get enough of them. I wanted to take the shilling myself, but my mother wouldn't hear of it. She needed me to help run the damn place. It took me years to pluck up enough courage to leave her. Well, more fool you. Leaving a gin palace just so you could take a turn at being a bleeding Rupert. Tommy Smith shook his head. I think it's all over now. Or nearly. I advised Major Peacock to take his head out of his arse. Jack winced at the memory. You did? Blimey! Smith sounded impressed. Well, you'll have to sort that one yourself. But dealing with Slater, that's easy. 
Easy. Have you seen the size of the bastard? He beat me tonight without breaking a sweat. I'm not suggesting you fight him, not if you can help it anyway. But fixing Slater couldn't be simpler. I'm astonished you haven't thought of it yourself. Well, why don't you enlighten me, seeing as I'm too stupid to see it for myself? You let the army fix him. And why would I do that? Jack shook his head at the notion, grimacing with the pain the sudden movement caused. He knows who I am. He'll peach on me and then it's all over. I'll be drumming my heels on the scaffold within a week. Who are they going to believe, Jack? A sergeant who has just arrived or one of their captains? Jack was silent. It was so obvious. Hadn't Slater been the one who had once mocked him for being powerless against the will of a sergeant? No one would disbelieve the word of an officer. You'd have to get in there first. Have him up on a charge for being drunk or for pissing on your boots or something. Take away his stripes for starters. And if that doesn't quieten him down, then get him flogged. You're the officer. He can't stand against you. He'd go insane. He'd kill me. Jack did his best to imagine Slater without his stripes. He couldn't do it. Well, sounds like he might do that anyway. Once you have him up on a charge, the army will do the rest, and no one will believe him if he starts ranting on about your past. If anything, that would just give more credence to your punishing him in the first place. Anyway, what have you got to lose? You can't exactly make things any worse now, can it? Jack stayed silent as he considered the idea. The pain of Slater's beating was fading as he contemplated a new future. The power of an officer over a redcoat, even a sergeant, was absolute. It would take one word, one accusation, and Slater would be at his mercy. Chapter 21 I would like to apologise for my behaviour, sir. The Colonel's tent was stuffy, despite the fact that the canvas flaps of the entrance were tied back as far as they would go. The smell of the Colonel's lunch still lingered, and a half-empty glass of claret added to its heady aroma. Jack did his best to hide his distaste, the sour air in the tent made all the worse by the bitter taste of the thick wedge of humble pie he had had to swallow. He was standing at attention in front of the Colonel, his shako under his left arm. The Colonel turned to the side to look at his second in command. Mr Peacock, do you accept Captain Sloams' apology? Peacock sniffed in disapproval. If he had had his way, Captain Sloams would already be on board a steamer heading back to England in disgrace. He had argued for that very punishment as vociferously as he had dared, but Colonel Morris would have none of it. Peacock nodded his assent with ill grace. I do, sir. Absit invidia. Morris looked hard at both officers. Seated behind a makeshift desk that his orderly had fashioned from empty ammunition crates, he looked more like a stern schoolmaster than a colonel in Her Majesty's army. Capital. I expect to hear no more of this episode from either of you. Peacock did not take the caution well and opened his mouth to protest. Morris raised a hand to quell his words. I will hear no more. The battalion will soon face the Russians, and I will not allow my officers to be distracted from their responsibilities by petty squabbles. Captain Sloams has apologised, and his apology has been accepted. That concludes this matter. Am I clear on that, gentlemen? Yes, sir. Jack was quick to reply. Good. Major Peacock, I'm sure you are anxious to be about your duties. Captain Sloams, if I could detain you for a moment longer, I would be obliged. Of course, sir, Peacock replied punctiliously and swept out of the tent. Despite the politely worded request, Peacock felt sure Morris had asked Sloames to remain on his own so that he could administer the dressing down the odious captain so obviously required. Peacock had enjoyed seeing Sloam standing in front of the desk like an errant schoolboy and with a face that looked as if he had received the type of beating reserved for newly arrived fags at Peacock's former school. The man was obviously a bounder, and a severe reprimand was exactly what was needed to bring him down a peg or three. Peacock hoped the colonel spared no punches. It was just a pity he could not stay to witness the spectacle in person. 
Inside the tent, Colonel Morris addressed the captain of his light company. Captain Sloams. I should not have to remind you that the successful operation of my battalion requires all of its officers to work together and to treat each other with the utmost respect. Morris steepled his fingers and tapped the tips against his bearded chin. No, sir. Nor should I have to remind you that altercations between my officers are unacceptable under any circumstances. No, sir. Any act that is prejudicial to the smooth operation of this battalion is an offence I take. Personally, I will not tolerate another foul outburst such as the one Major Peacock reported to me. Do I make myself perfectly clear? Jack stared into the space six inches above the Colonel's tightly cropped, iron grey head of hair, grateful that his years in the army had taught him how to deal with discontented officers. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. Three bloody bags full, sir. You're barely listening to a word I say, are you, you damn scoundrel? The outburst took Jack by surprise. He dropped his scrutiny of the tent wall and looked at the colonel. That's better. Morris smiled at Jack with surprising warmth. Oh, I recognise the tactic. I wasn't born yesterday. I appreciate it's the best way to deal with a superior officer. I still use it myself on occasion. Jack watched the colonel warily. Keeping his guard up and his face neutral. It's a shame that we did not get to know one another before this campaign began. The colonel paused to see if Jack would speak, but it was obvious that he was still wary of his commanding officer, as well he should be. Peacock is a stuffed shirt. I do appreciate that. The sudden admission startled Jack into a response, sir. I know how Peacock is regarded in the battalion. I appreciate how difficult he can be. However, that does not excuse one of my captains insulting him. Jack bowed his head. I know, sir. I was wrong. Goodness me, you disappoint me. You're a damn sight meeker than I'd been led to believe. The barbed comment stung. I- I'm not sure what you mean, sir. I mean. Captain Sloanes, that I have heard many things about you, but none of them included tales of your meekness. Jack did not respond. I have heard, Morris continued, that you are a capable and efficient officer who is turning the light company into an excellent unit. Yet, I also hear that you are taciturn. Some would say withdrawn and a loner. From Major Peacock, I hear you are a vile, foul-mouthed brute. Who deserves to be shipped home in disgrace? In short, the light company appears to be led by a man I know very little about, and who now presents himself in front of me, looking like a backstreet brawler. Again, Jack chose not to comment. A gentle sigh of disapproval was the only evidence that his silence was not to the colonel's liking. I shall speak plainly. My battalion is shortly to be involved in a battle that will test us all. But I am confident of my men. We will not let the regiment down. I am certain of that. Yet, I find myself faced with a dilemma. Morris paused and fixed Jack with a firm gaze from under his furrowed brow. You, sir, are the cause of this dilemma. There is something about you, Sloanes. I'm a good judge of character, and my instinct tells me that you are not quite what you seem. Jack was feeling uncomfortable under the colonel's intense scrutiny, and it was an effort to stand still and let no sign of his anxiety show. So, I have to ask myself if I trust you, and to be honest, I have no clear answer to that question. I do not expect my captains to be milksops. I need men of strong character and iron self-discipline to lead my companies. You, Mister Sloanes, showed singular lack of self-control in your dealings with Major Peacock. That concerns me a great deal. Morris paused and looked down at his fingers. However, on this occasion, I shall give you the benefit of the doubt. I will be expecting great things of you and your men. Do not let me down. Relief coursed through Jack. 
I won't, sir. I give you my word. His voice cracked with emotion as he spoke. Morris nodded and rose to his feet, extending his hand. I will be watching you, he said, as he took Jack's hand in his firm grip. God help you if you fail, because I shall not, I promise you that. Jack walked out of the stuffy confines of the colonel's tent and into the bright morning sunshine. The lecture had shamed him, but the colonel's firm support had left him determined not to let the battalion down. Captain Sloams! The portly figure of Lieutenant Digby Brown lurched upright from where he'd been perching on a water butt a short distance from the tent. Digby Brown, what a delightful surprise. Sorry to bother you, sir, Digby Brown replied, and then stopped as he saw the state of his captain's face. You look like you've been in the war, sir. Digby Brown tried not to smile. What do you want, Digby Brown? Jack's positive mood faded in the face of his subaltern's grating presence. Fusilier Hayward has reported sick. Why is that a problem? Half this bloody army's sick. Yes, sir. However, half this army has not been beaten to a pulp. Hayward has, and the fool is refusing to tell us who did it. Jack felt a sinking feeling deep in his gut. Slater was more than capable of beating one of his own men. It was typical of his brutal tactics. Beat one man in the company as a warning to the rest. The sergeant was moving fast. Soon he would have the whole company eating out of his hand. He had to be stopped, and stopped quickly. You'd better take me to him. Fusilier Hayward was a mess. Digby Brown had at least had the sense to leave the battered young fusilier with the company, away from the gaze of the battalion. Jack could not help wincing as he took in Hayward's injuries. He looked even worse than he himself had done after his own bruising encounter with Slater's fists. Both of Hayward's eyes were closed behind thick purple swelling. Welts and gouges covered his face, and his mouth had been reduced to a pulp. He was barely recognisable. The rest of the fusilier was surprisingly intact, Slater presumably concentrating on the face to give the most vivid demonstration of his viciousness to the rest of the light company. It would take a brave man to risk receiving such a battering. Have him taken down to the beach by two of our own men, Jack ordered Digby Brown. I don't want some callous bandsman making the trip a torment for him. He suffered enough. Yes, sir, I'll take him myself. Digby Brown noticed the concern on his captain's face at seeing Hayward's injuries. It was obvious Sloams cared rather more about his men than Digby Brown had given him credit for. How do you think this happened? How do you think some vicious bastard gave him one hell of a beating? One of our men? Most likely. But why? I mean, we are all in the same company. I cannot believe one of our men is guilty of such brutality. Don't be so damn naive, Jack snapped. Half of the men come from the poorest back streets of London. Violence is the common currency of their sorry lives. Jack did not try to hide his contempt for Digby Brown. The lieutenant had no concept of the lives formerly led by the men he commanded. Digby Brown was not to blame for the station into which he had been born, but Jack did blame him for having neither the wit nor the intelligence to learn about the men he was responsible for. To Jack, that was unforgivable, and all too typical of the supercilious officer class. Get Hayward to the medical staff on the beach, Jack finished curtly, dismissing his troubled lieutenant. His thoughts turned to the perpetrator of the cruel beating. It was time to make Slater pay for his crimes. Chapter 22 Drunk. Not only drunk, Flowers, but drunk on duty. I also have grounds to believe he was responsible for an assault on another of my men. I can scarcely credit it. The adjutant was appalled. Why, he, he's only just joined the regiment. Jack shook his head, as if he too could not believe what he was reporting. I fear we now know why he was thrown out of his former battalion. He was a colour sergeant there, I hear, but he lost his colours for victimising the men under his command. 
It would also appear he has a habit of making up fanciful tales to suit his spite. It's a bad show all round. He'll have to lose his stripes, of course. Of course. Jack tried to look suitably sombre. Now I'll arrange for him to transfer to another company. The timing's not ideal, but it would be for the best. Lieutenant Flowers shook his head. What possessed him? Drink really is the devil. Perhaps the temperance movement has it right. Jack thought of the toothless drunks who begged or stole all day simply to be able to buy the watered-down gin his mother sold. There could be no better example of the evil of drink. But it had never made him hesitate when the ale was being poured. Can you really imagine living without a drink, Flowers? No claret, no porter, no whisky to dull the pain of an evening listening to Major Peacock? You do have a point, Flowers sighed. Captain Devine can take him. His company is at the lowest strength. Let him make a fresh start in another company. I'd rather keep him. Give him another chance to prove himself. Jack wanted Slater close. There was no telling how he would react to losing his stripes, and Jack was determined not to give the brutal man any opportunity to spread his poison around another officer's company. That's very generous of you. But do you think it's wise? The man is obviously a malcontent. I'd rather not. He's my problem. I don't like to hoist him on someone else. Well, it's your decision. And one that does you great credit. I'll arrange for the colonel to deal with it this afternoon. He won't be best pleased. He has other things on his mind. Such as? Jack sensed news. The adjutant looked around to check that no one could overhear him, and then dropped his voice. Look, I shouldn't be telling you this. The colonel wants to make a big announcement after church parade this afternoon, and he'll have a fit if he finds out I've stolen his thunder. Orders have come through from brigade. Raglan has agreed to march. I've no idea why he thinks we're ready to move, but there you have it. I'm told the French have been making one hell of a fuss as we sit here dilly-dallying. So, ready or not, we're to be off. It was the news the army had long waited to hear. The campaign was about to begin in earnest. There was barely a cloud to trouble the grey-blue expanse of sky that, to Jack, seemed to have taken on a vastness he had never seen. It stretched from one distant horizon to the other, one great canopy of such immensity that it left him feeling very small. The sun did nothing to lift the spirits of the men who knew they must shortly suffer a long, exhausting march under its unseasonable heat. It brought back memories of the dire period they had endured in the feverish heat at the camp in Varna prior to their departure for the Crimea. Jack found Tommy Smith working with McCulloch's orderly Johnson, using a shot case and round shot to grind up more of the green coffee beans that the battalion's officers consumed at a terrific rate. Good morning. Nice to see you both working on such an important task. Jack forced himself to sound jovial in front of McCulloch's orderly. Morning, sir. Lovely day. Johnson's familiar London accent made Jack smile. It is indeed, Johnson, he agreed. But I'm afraid I need to borrow Smith. Course, sir, no bother. He's no bleeding use anyhow. You're welcome to him. Thank you, Johnson. Smith, come with me, please. Jack led Smith away from the keen ears of his fellow orderly. The officer's servants thrived on gossip, as he himself knew only too well. As soon as they were far enough away, Jack confided the adjutant's information to his orderly, who took in the news calmly and immediately understood the need for caution. Any advantage to the light company would disappear if the news spread and they had to compete with nearly 600 men all trying to grab a share of the meagre supplies available. "'What would you like me to do first, sir?' Smith asked, keeping his voice low and slowly scanning the surrounding area for anyone who could overhear them. Well, for starters, you can stop looking so damn furtive. Sorry, bit out of practice. Jack chuckled. I'm glad to hear that. I can't keep checking to see if you filch my pocketbook every time I stand near you. Now, sir, as if I would turn your pockets. Besides, I was never a pickpocket. I had more class. Truly, you never cease to amaze me. Jack shook his head. I have some good news about Slater. I spoke to the adjutant and it's done. 
He'll face a battalion court-martial this afternoon. I'll be there. It's just a formality. He'll be reduced to the ranks. Smith smiled at the news. It's no less than he deserves after what he did to young Hayward, not to mention yourself. So, what do we do about Slater now? He'll be after you. For now, there's nothing more we can do. But watch my back. Jack looked at Smith keenly, seeking reassurance. Just let me get a clear shot of the bastard, sir. I'll sort him out. After me, Tommy. After me. Jack put the happy notion to one side. Now, as soon as the colonel announces that we're finally to march inland, all hell will break loose. The most important thing is water. I know it's already hard to get enough, but we need to make certain the men's canteens are full and that we get as much extra as we can carry. Right you are, Smith nodded. Next, ammunition. No, that's done, Smith said. Digby Brown carried out an ammunition check after roll call this morning. We all have our full tally. Not even Welsh Davis can have flogged any to the tinkers yet. Very good. Jack was surprised. Perhaps Digby Brown was finally starting to contribute to the effective running of the company. So, that leaves the rations. We'll have to wait for whatever the rest of the battalion gets issued, but looking around the place... Jack gestured towards the many heaps of supplies that lay dumped around the battalion lines. There's no way in hell we can take everything with us. Forage around a bit and see what you can square away. And see if you can sniff me out some tea. I'm getting heartily sick of all that bloody green coffee. Well, I'm sure I can manage that. I'll say you're planning to take us off for another drill first thing in the morning, so we need to get ready today. No one will question that. Moan like buggery and call you every name under the sun, but question it, nah. I think I'll ignore that last remark, Fusilier. As you choose. Smith hesitated. The men... think you're doing well, sir. They seem to like you. What? Now Jack was truly surprised. He had not forgotten the near disaster of facing the Cossacks, and he did not think the men had either. Oh, they think you're a rum cove, all right, and they'd as soon see you piss off and leave them alone, but they're coming round to you. Especially since they heard about you taking a pop at Peacock. Jack looked his orderly in the eye, suspecting some flummery or banter in the words. But Smith met his gaze, his expression serious. Well, I'm damn pleased to hear it. It's about time I get some bloody recognition. But of course they don't know you're a fraud, so don't let your head swell too much, will you? Or it's likely to get shot right off. Jack grinned. Not much chance of that with you to remind me, Smith. Chapter 23 Revalli sounded in the darkness. The bugle call was picked up and repeated throughout the three armies, strident and remorseless, demanding immediate action. The British army scrambled to its feet, resembling an anthill that had been poked violently with a stick. They were still woefully unprepared for the long-awaited march. Despairing officers tried to organise their commands and bring order from the confusion, a hopeless endeavour made worse by the ill-informed staff officers to whom they turned for orders. To the bewilderment and consternation of their French allies, the British were not ready to march at four o'clock as had been agreed the previous evening, nor were they ready at five o'clock. As the early morning light pushed away the darkness, the chaos in their lines was all too apparent. The failure of the British commissariat was complete. Seven hundred wagons had been expected, but barely one-third of that number had arrived. Mountains of supplies would have to be abandoned where they lay. The more enterprising soldiers were taking advantage of the disorder by pilfering the stores, filling their pockets and their greatcoats with extra rations, adding more confusion and delay. Dealing with the mountain of stores was not the only task left outstanding. There were dozens of sick to be stretched back to the beach and handed into the dubious care of the army's medical staff. Water still had to be found for the soldiers' canteens, no easy task given that the few wells that had been dug now produced only a little brackish water. Rations waited to be distributed, the meat to be carried raw, no time left for the soldiers to cook the salted pork that was all the army provided. The British army was in total disarray. The French looked on, appalled. 
Their bandsmen bugled and drummed impatiently, as if the martial music could inspire, cajole or shame their maddeningly disorganised allies to order. The French troops had been ready to march since before dawn. They sat despondently on the ground, wondering at the sanity of their masters who had tied their fate to the bungling British. The coolness of the early morning gradually melted away, the heat building steadily as the sun rose. Miraculously, at nine o'clock in the morning, the British army was finally ready to march. The redcoats had muddled their way to readiness, the enterprise and industry of the battalion officers succeeding where the professionals in the commissariat had failed so completely. In all their martial splendour, the armies of three countries would march directly for the Russian port of Sevastopol, the key objective of the campaign. Sunlight glinted off metal, battalion colours were unfurled, uniforms of every colour were massed in ranks of infantrymen, guardsmen, fusiliers, grenadiers, gunners, hussars, dragoons and lancers. It was a sight to stir the heart of even the most reluctant soldier. The French would march on the right flank, with the sea and the might of the two navies on their right. With the French marched Suleiman Pasha and his 6,000 Turkish soldiers. The British would march on the left. To smooth the ruffled feathers of the French generals, Raglan, ever the politician, had acceded to their demands to dictate the order of the march. Perhaps the politics of the joint command had distracted the British commander, or perhaps Raglan saw no danger in the station the British had agreed to occupy in the combined column. Whatever the reason, the British marched with their left flank dangerously exposed. In the days of Wellington, cavalry outriders would have been dispatched to patrol and protect the exposed flank. Intrepid young officers on fast, corn-fed horses would ride into the wide plains, probing for danger, so that no enemy formation could approach the open flank undetected. But Wellington was dead, and the British army marched in one compact mass, its flank exposed save for a thin screen of light cavalry. But this was not a morning for doubts. Led by their colours, the British soldiers left their fears, their misgivings and their complaints behind them, the brave and stirring tunes from their regimental bands propelling them forward. The cavalry led the way, the dandies and the aristocrats at the fore, their horses prancing in excitement. Lord Cardigan, with the 13th Light Dragoons and the 11th Hussars, formed the vanguard of the army. His bitterest enemy, Lord Lucan, who also happened to be his brother-in-law and his commanding officer, led the 8th Hussars and the 17th Lancers on the left flank. Behind them marched the Rifle Brigade, the feared green jackets who had once so tormented Napoleon's veterans on the battlefields of Portugal, Spain and France. Then the green jackets had been the acclaimed masters of the skirmish line. Now their descendants were desperate to prove their superiority once again. Even in the modern world where every soldier bore the once coveted power of the rifle. Behind them came the infantry, the men Wellington so harshly titled the scum of the earth. They were the least regarded, yet the most important of all the troops that marched that day, for it was the humble redcoat who would decide the fate of the battle to come. Victories were not won by the glamorous cavalry or by the hard-bitten professionals of the rifles. Even the deadly killing machines of the artillery would not decide who was victorious. Battles were won by the tenacity, the bravery and the sheer bloody-mindedness of the massed ranks of the infantry. Whether they were guardsmen, fusiliers, grenadiers or just plain red-coated infantrymen, all battles came down to their ability to deliver the power of their massed volleys, their willingness to endure the carnage inflicted upon them and the raw courage that would see them close to butcher the enemy with their bayonets. The King's Royal Fusiliers marched at the head of the Light Division. The Fusiliers had suffered their fair share of disorder that morning. Many of the men marched with half-full canteens of water, or with barely enough rations to last them the day. Yet they marched with pride. It was a day to saviour being a Fusilier in the service of the Queen. Jack marched proudly at the head of his company. 
It was hard for him not to look smug, so he did not even try, instead merely nodding his head in acknowledgement of the scowls of his brother officers, whose men marched inadequately prepared. The light company marched with full canteens of water, and the sergeants and corporals carried numerous spares. Their ration bags were full, and Tommy Smith even marched with one of his spare stockings crammed full of tea liberated from one of the many abandoned supply chests. One company, at least, would not be going short. The Fusiliers' band struck up the opening bars of Cheer, Boys, Cheer. It was a firm favourite in the battalion, and Jack grinned as he heard the men begin to sing in their deep and surprisingly melodic voices. The company had come a long way in the few days since they had landed. The men now marched with a cocky air about them, a sureness that had been missing earlier. Watching them, Jack could almost believe they took a certain pride in being one of the first troops to have engaged the enemy. Only the looming presence of Slater cast a shadow over his own confidence. He turned and saw the enormous redcoat marching easily in his allotted station, his long, loping stride and confident demeanour a reminder of the man's power. If the whole company had at first been wary of the new arrival, now they were openly fearful of him. The loss of his sergeant's stripes had added a chilling bitterness to the man, and not even the boldest redcoat wanted to spend a moment in his company. The first light company fusilier collapsed shortly before the march was one hour old. Fusilier Macclesbridge had been convinced he had been dying for days. His messmates, long used to his complaints, ignored his whines and daily litany of distress. If Macclesbridge was not complaining of dying of thirst, then he was starving to death. He did not get a fever without being certain he had got the plague. That morning he had woken convinced that he had the cholera, and his comrades had laughed at his malingering ways. Yet, this time, he was right. One moment he was cursing as the men marching around him belted out the chorus to The Girl I Left Behind. The next, his face darkened and he stumbled forwards, crashing into the back of the man in front and falling to the ground, choking on a torrent of vomit that erupted from his throat. Macclesbridge was the first to fall, but he was not the last. The heat of the sun cooked the fusiliers in their thick woollen coats, stewing them in a soup of sweat that chafed their skin. Another two men from the company collapsed before midday, unable to find the strength to march under the maddening heat. After the first few hard miles, barely one fusilier had more than a few mouthfuls of warm, brackish water left in his canteen. The march had barely begun, but already the men trudged in misery. They soon marched in silence, the joy of the early morning forgotten. The bandsmen had been forced to stow their musical instruments and carry out their secondary role as stretcher-bearers, hauling the sick out of the line of march lest they be trampled into the dust by the never-ending procession that ground its way forward. All too soon, the bandsmen were overwhelmed by the sheer number of men falling to the ground and by the dozens of redcoats who were too weak to rise to their feet after the halts that were now being called every half hour. The pace of the march slowed to barely a crawl. The ground behind and to either side of the army became littered with abandoned equipment and with the crumpled forms of those unable to carry on. Men sank to their knees in delirium, their anguished cries for water breaking the hearts of their mates who could do nothing but march on and leave them to the less than tender mercies of the overworked bandsmen. After another hour picking their way through the detritus that littered the path ahead of them, the fusiliers could march no more. The men fell out before the order was given, many sinking to the ground where they stood. The army was disintegrating. The heat and the cholera threatened to end the campaign after barely ten miles. Jack observed the pale faces of his men as they sank to the ground. He saw their drawn, haggard expressions, their mouths tinged blue from dehydration. Worst of all was the listlessness and the exhaustion in their eyes. It would be a relief to sink to the ground with them, to give in to the pain that racked his body. A terrible thirst tormented his every thought. Anything was preferable to the torture of carrying on in this living hell. But Jack refused to give in. 
Everything he had gone through since the army had landed a few short days ago would be for naught if he gave in to the demands of his battered body. A mocking laugh caught his attention. Jack turned his head to see which of his men had the energy to find something in this terrible situation to laugh about. Sitting to one side of the company, Slater took a long drink from a full canteen, carelessly letting drops of the precious water spill from his lips. Against his will, Jack licked his cracked and swollen lips, helpless in the face of his desire to drink. He could smell the water. The mere thought of drinking made his body tremble with desire. Slater watched the company's reaction as he drank. He lowered the canteen slowly, his lips wet from the long draught. He leisurely wiped the back of his hand across his mouth and belched. The men turned away. Jack watched the performance, his hands clenching into fists at his impotence to deal with the bastard's mockery. Slater would pay for this particular pantomime, as he would pay for all his violent thuggery. But revenge would have to wait. With the column of infantry stalled, staff officers galloped backwards and forwards to rouse the men, the flanks of their tired mounts lathered in sweat. "'To your feet!' Colonel Morris shouted. On horseback, the colonel looked imposing. His charger was huge, jet black save for a white blaze on its forehead, and of such an evil temper that only the colonel could ride him. Now the fine horse was streaked with sweat, its eyes rolling in their sockets as Morris paraded him past the slumped ranks of his battalions. On your feet, my boys! On your feet, my brave, brave boys! Jack expected the colonel's call to go unheeded, but to his surprise, the men dug deep into their reserves of strength and struggled to their feet once more, responding to their beloved colonel. Like an army of the dead, the fusiliers rose from the ground and stumbled back into formation. That's it, my boys! Morris applauded the effort, encouraging his men as best he could. I am proud of you. Proud of all of you, he shouted, moving up and down the flank of the column that was slowly taking shape. That's the way. It will be time to rest soon enough, but not now. One more effort. One more march. A handful of staff officers came galloping back down the length of the infantry column, their urgency attracting the attention of those fusiliers with enough strength to still be interested in their surroundings. One, a cornet from the 7th Hussars, reined in hard alongside Colonel Morris. The hussar's officer's bay horse skittered nervously, moving in a tight circle as the cornet leant forward in his saddle to hand a piece of paper to Morris. The colonel scanned the paper quickly, his brow furrowing. His eyes darted across the few short lines before he looked up, his leathery face creasing into a smile. "'This is it, boys!' he shouted, standing in his stirrups to call down the length of the battalion. The Russians are ahead! The Russian bear had stirred. The road to Sevastopol was blocked. Chapter 24 Water! No other single word could have created more disruption on the order and discipline of a British army battalion. The fusilier had spied the small stream twisting its way along the shallow valley ahead and joyfully announced its presence to the rest of the regiment. The fusiliers had trudged over the low-rise footsore, dehydrated and close to collapse. Yet the single word transformed them. Without a word of command, the column stopped, the men quivering with eagerness, like hounds smelling the fox for the first time. Colonel Morris beamed with pride as the men held their ranks despite their desperate desire to drink. Every head turned to stare at the colonel, the same look of longing on all their faces. Morris could not deny them. Go, my boys, you have earned it. Released, the redcoats streamed forward, the men pulling and elbowing each other in their desperate haste to reach the small stream. Men who minutes earlier had felt ready to lie down and die found the strength to race forwards down the shallow slope towards the Bulganak River. They threw themselves into the shallow stream, thrusting their heads into the ice-cold water or cupping their hands and gulping it down their parched throats as fast as they could. And the officers joined them. 
Colonel Morris alone held back, walking his horse behind the rearmost and slowest moving fusiliers. Only when the drenched fusiliers returned to the north bank of the river, their heavy uniforms soaking but their thirst satiated and their canteens full, did he allow his horse to bow its head so it too could drink. Would you be so kind, Sloams? Jack stood in the centre of the stream, the slow-moving water rippling around his boots. His stomach ached with the cold water he had gulped down. He looked up to see Morris holding out his canteen. Without a word, Jack reached out, took the canteen and squatted down, removing the stopper as he did so. It was only when he handed the full container back did he see the strain on Morris's face. Obliged to you. Morris tipped back his head and took a long draught from the canteen, closing his eyes at the exquisite pleasure of the fresh water cascading down his throat. It took several seconds before he lowered the canteen, leaving a few errant drops of water captured in the wiry grey hairs of his beard. Morris replaced the stopper. Mr. Sloams, form your company, if you please. We have work to do. A troop of the 13th Light Dragoons splashed noisily through the river. The horses' hooves flung the water high into the air so that the brief sunlight flashed off thousands of droplets. More dragoons were riding down the shallow slope towards the river. The cavalrymen looked down in disdain at the soaked fusiliers as they rode past, their sneers and shouted insults leaving the redcoats wondering who the true enemy was. Jack looked to the south, the direction the cavalry was taking. There, half a mile distant, Russian Cossacks lined the brow of the hill. A chill ran down Jack's spine. Muttering imprecations, he went to form up his company. Jesus Christ, if they could bleed in shoot straight, they'd be fucking dangerous. Silence in the ranks, Sergeant Baker snarled from his place behind the company, his eyes scanning the men as he tried to identify the culprit. The redcoats stood stoically in their ranks as the sun beat down. The sweat poured freely down their bodies and faces, but at least they had a grandstand view of the afternoon's entertainment. The battalion was deployed in a line two ranks deep, spread like a long red chain on the brow of the shallow slope to the south of the Bulganak River. It had not taken the 13th Light Dragoons long to drive off the few Cossacks who had been observing the movements of the army, and the Fusiliers had been ordered forward to take up position on the crest of the slope the Cossacks had vacated. To their front, Lord Cardigan had led the Light Cavalry forward in skirmish order, and for the last twenty minutes they had been engaged in a vigorous but so far ineffectual exchange of gunfire with a large body of Russian cavalry. Neither side appeared capable of hitting their targets. From their vantage point on the low crest, the fusiliers watched in disappointment as the brisk exchange of fire failed to inflict a single casualty on either side. It reminds me very much of a review day at Chobham. Captain McCulloch had wandered over to join the light company, making his observation as he approached where Jack stood observing the afternoon's display. McCulloch's second company was formed on the light company's right flank. The light company itself was the furthest left of the whole battalion, with Captain Brewer and his grenadiers at the opposite end on the battalion's right flank. This was the first time the two officers had spoken since the night of Jack's abuse of Major Peacock. I wouldn't know, as I've never had the pleasure. Although I hear review days are about as interesting as listening to Brewer fart. At least our damn cavalry are not spoiling the spectacle by actually hitting something. McCulloch winced at the colourful language. So you have not yet learnt to moderate your language, Sloams? No, I'm afraid I haven't. Nor do I think I ever shall. He turned to face McCulloch. But... I have learnt to appreciate when I'm being a complete fool. I can only apologise for my appalling behaviour. It was unacceptable, and I truly regret that it ever happened. McCulloch met Jack's intense gaze. A moment's scrutiny was all it took for him to believe Jack was telling the truth. Let us hear no more about it, then. Let bygones be bygones and all that. 
McCulloch lifted his shako by its peak and wiped his hand across his sweat-streaked forehead. He slicked his damp hair down with a grimace of distaste. Thank you. Jack offered McCulloch his hand. Oh, there's no need for that, old fellow, said McCulloch, shaking Jack's hand anyhow. We all have our off days. Jack and McCulloch stood in companionable silence, watching the British cavalry engage their Russian counterparts in a wasteful and ineffective duel of musketry. The sight of a single Russian trooper silently crumpling over and falling to the ground raised such a cheer from the watching British troops that the cavalrymen of both sides turned to look at the source of the huge hurrah. The sporadic gunfire soon resumed and proved as wasteful as before. The mute participation of the British infantrymen became languid and sleepy. General Raglan steadfastly refused to allow the infantry to join the attack. He was anxious to avoid a general action until his army was consolidated and so he held his men back, refusing to be drawn into a precipitate advance. There was nothing for the infantry to do other than to roast in the sun and endure the heat, the flies, the boredom and the thirst. The foolishness of the inactivity was not lost on the battalion's officers as a steady trickle of men collapsed from heatstroke, victims to their general's feckless caution. Aha! This looks more like it. Action at last! McCulloch said happily, announcing a change in the tiresome skirmish. Jack had been engaged in a battle of his own as he fought to keep his heavy eyelids from closing. The effects of the long march and the cavalry's ineptitude had combined to leave him struggling to stay awake. It was with some difficulty that he lifted his gritty and sore eyes to see what had caught McCulloch's attention. A squadron of Russian cavalry spurred towards the British dragoon's left flank, the first purposeful movement either side had managed for the last half hour. With a precision that put the languid movements of the British cavalrymen to shame, the Russian cavalry opened in the centre, the separate halves of the squadron peeling back left and right, revealing the battery of guns that they had so skilfully been screening. Oh, well done! Well done indeed! McCulloch could not resist praising the beautifully executed manoeuvre. The Russian artillery opened fire as the last of their cavalry spurred their way clear, the puffs of smoke from the mouths of their cannon clearly visible moments before the noise of the cannonade could be heard. There! We are privileged indeed, Sloams. We have witnessed the first cannon of the campaign being fired. McCulloch pulled hard on the hem of his jacket and picked a small bit of lint from his lapel as he spoke, as if to be present at such a historic moment made him uncomfortable. Let us hope our cavalry is pleased. I'm not sure I'd be so keen to see the first cannon shot of the campaign if I was on the receiving end of it as they are. McCulloch chose to ignore Jack's somewhat caustic observation. I had better get back to my company. I'm glad we had the opportunity to talk. Enjoy the day, McCulloch. And don't forget, out of vincere, out of mori. Jack mangled the Latin phrase he had heard for the first time on the night of his confrontation with Major Peacock. His sarcasm brought a wry smile of acknowledgement from McCulloch. Mr. Sloanes, you are incorrigible. God willing, I shall see you later and we can work on your pronunciation. You sounded like a constipated clergyman. McCulloch nodded his farewell and left Jack to enjoy the display the cavalrymen were putting on. A battery of British horse artillery careered to a noisy halt a short distance to the left of Jack's company, stung into action by the skill of the Russian horse artillery. The suddenness of their arrival stirred many of the light company from their sun-induced stupor. The gunners prepared their weapons to fire to the clipped orders of their sergeant. The sight was a much greater interest than the shambolic performance of the skirmishing cavalry. The Russian artillery fired a second volley before the British gunners were ready to reply. From their elevated viewpoint, the light company could trace the pencil-thin track the round shot left as they flew through the air towards the dispersed ranks of the cavalry. In the widely spaced skirmish order, the dragoons and hussars offered a poor target for the Russian gunners, and the heavy barrage struck down only a single dragoon. 
An ear-ringing explosion of noise and smoke to the light company's left announced that the British battery was returning fire. Far to the battalion's right, a second British battery opened up, the deep cough of these guns identifying them as bigger bored nine-pounders. Despite the cloud of foul-smelling powder smoke that partially blocked the fusilier's view, it was clear the British were directing their fire with greater effect than their Russian counterparts. Several Russian cavalrymen and horses were struck by the first British volley. The Russian gunners bravely fired again, resolutely sticking to their task despite the storm of round shot that crashed about their ears. It was a courageous display, but one that only served to goad the British gunners to greater energy. With another explosion of noise and smoke, the British guns fired again. When the smoke cleared, the fusiliers could see that the Russian gunners had seen sense. With a haste born of fear, they hurried to limber their guns before the British fired on them once more. The British gunners would not let the Russian gunners skulk away unmolested. The artillerymen were serving their guns with intensity, and rivers of sweat streamed down their powder-stained faces as they raced to reload. Within moments, another British volley crashed out, and then another, maiming and killing indiscriminately. The fusiliers watched in subdued silence as the British artillery exacted a dreadful toll on the retreating enemy gunners. Soon, they witnessed the devastating power of artillery close up, as the few British casualties were brought back towards the rear. One young Hussar trooper had been draped unconscious across his saddle. His body jerked like a rag doll, a bleeding, tattered stump, all that remained of one of his legs. The gory sight of the man's ripped limb, the bone and flesh mangled into something unrecognisable as being human, turned many a stomach among the watching men. This time, the fusiliers had been able to stand on the sidelines and watch as other young soldiers experienced the raw horror of war. A few miles to the south, the main body of the Russian army waited. Tomorrow, the King's Royal Fusiliers would have to take their place in the battle line and face the stark reality of battle for themselves. Chapter 25 The battalion spent the night on the same ground they had occupied through the long, dull afternoon. The fusiliers were grateful to be bivouacked close to the river Bulganak. This gave them easy access to fresh water, even if the thin stream had been churned to a muddy soup by the incessant passage of men and horses, and the thick ferns and lavender bushes that grew on its bank provided fuel for their fires. By some miracle, the army had delivered fresh rations, including the blessed casks that would supply them with their treasured ration of rum. Only the columns of smoke on the horizon gave a reminder of what they would face the following day. The Russian army had torched the closest villages, denying any sanctuary to the invading armies. Four rivers blocked the Allies' route to Sevastopol. The first, the Bulganak, was now behind them. That left the Alma, the Katcha and the Belbek. Already rumours were spreading through the army. It was said that 50,000 Russian infantrymen waited on the formidable heights that bordered the river Alma, supported by a huge number of cavalry and cannon. Their position was strengthened by fearsome fortifications constructed in the time gifted to the Russian defenders by the British army's lethargic preparations and delayed advance. The Russian general, his serenity Prince Alexander Sergeyevich Menshikov, was reputed to have boasted that he could hold the position for weeks, even in the face of the most determined assault. The Alma would run red with the blood of the hated invaders. Jack closed his eyes in pleasure as he relished the flavour of the scalding hot tea, a welcome contrast to the tartness of the green coffee he was usually forced to drink. His body ached, and he craved the oblivion of sleep, but first he would check on his men. He threw the dregs of his tea onto the dusty ground and forced himself to his feet. The men of the light company lay sprawled around their hastily constructed fires. They were now adept at making the best of wherever they found themselves. Jack had released his two subalterns, giving them leave to visit their friends in the other companies. 
It left him alone, and for once he did not feel his usual jealousy of the companionship they shared with their mates. He was content to spend the time with his company. Tonight, it was where he belonged. Jack felt a fierce affection for the men. The redcoats enjoyed little in the way of comfort, earned the pittance, and endured terrible hardships and ferocious discipline. Yet they faced it all with a stoicism that was scarcely credible. With their mates at their side, they would go into battle with the same resolute spirit that they dealt with everything else the army threw at them. Jack knew now that to lead a company of soldiers was a privilege that few deserved, him least of all. It had been a terrible presumption to think that he was worthy of the commission he had stolen. He had believed the life of an officer was easy, full of undeserved privilege and comfort. He had not seen the responsibility that the officers carried constantly. Now he understood what it meant to lead men. Yet as heavy as that burden was, he would not surrender it for anything. Evening, sir. The greeting came from Fusilier Dodds, one of the company comedians. He was too fly for his own good, which got him into far too much trouble with Sergeant Baker, and meant he was still an ordinary Fusilier even after fifteen years' service. He was also one of the most popular soldiers in the company. He looked a typical rogue, his scrawny frame and gaunt face so typical of the soldiers who hailed from the rookeries of London. Like many of the Fusiliers, Dodds had joined the army to get away from the dreadful conditions of the workhouse and a lifetime of grinding poverty. Good evening, Dodds. Was it warm enough for you today? Warm, sir. It was fair roasting. Still, it weren't as bad for us as it was for them Turkish fellows. And how's that, Dodds? Jack asked cautiously, sensing this was exactly the question Dodds wanted him to ask. Well... They's Ottomans, ain't they? Dodd's face creased into a grin. His messmates groaned at the desperate pun. I expect you spent all day thinking that up, Jack said wryly. He must have, sir, Fusilier Troughton, one of Dodd's messmate, called. He was pulling such a face all day we thought he was sickening for the bleeding chokey. It must have been him thinking. The rest of the small group doubled up. The laughter was much too loud for such low jesting. The men were clinging to their humour to contain the terror that bubbled below the surface. It was the night before battle, and no sane man could face the future without fear. The dread picked at their courage and gnawed at their spirits. Yet not one of the fusiliers would admit to their fears. Jack left the men laughing, his exhausted body and throbbing back finding walking easier than standing in one place. The men at the next fire looked up as he came close, their grimy faces turning to stare at him apprehensively as he approached. Good evening. This time Jack spoke first. The group was made up of the new recruits who had joined the company with Slater. In those early days, they found it easier to stick together. It would take time for them to fit in, to be accepted as belonging to the company, it was not something that could be forced or hurried. Fear and anxiety was etched on the pale faces of the newcomers. Without the easy camaraderie of Dodds and his messmates, the newest additions to the company would have to face their fear quietly, hiding the terror behind the silent domestic rituals of cooking their rations and settling to rest. The men seemed nervous at the sudden appearance of their company commander, and just bobbed their heads in acknowledgement of his greeting. One of their fellow recruits had collapsed on the march, claimed by the searing heat of the sun. The company had lost three men that day, losses it could do without so close to battle. None of the victims had died, but all were lost to the confusion of the army system of caring for the sick and wounded. No one expected to see them again. Even if they returned to health, it was more than likely they would be sent to another battalion and their entries in the company's books crossed through. Jack left the new recruits to eat their rations in peace, remembering how daunting the presence of an officer could be. Nothing he could say would allay their fear or banish the thoughts of what awaited them tomorrow. They would simply have to cope 
as every man had to, alone. Hello there, sir. Have you not had your fill of walking? I know I bloody well have. The sing-song accent of Welsh Davis welcomed Jack into the group of men gathered round the next campfire. He walked into the circle of light, its warmth reeling him in like a trout on a lure. Do you still call that walking? I thought it was more like a pleasant stroll in the countryside. Twere that, Captain. The broad West Country baritone of English Davis rumbled from the far side of the fire. The two Davises were never far from each other, as if their common name created a natural bond between them. Thank you, English. Jack looked round the small circle. Make sure your rifles are ready for tomorrow. I have a feeling you're going to need them. Jack offered the unnecessary advice more for something to say than for any practical reason. These were his best men. They seemed to be drawn to each other, their experience and skill forming them into a special cadre at the core of the company. I plan to sleep with my minier captain, and I'll caress her sweet curves all night long, so I will. This from Dawson, the smallest man in the company. Hoots and whistles greeted his comment. Why, you said the same thing about your old Bessie, Taylor, who was old enough to be Dawson's grandfather, said in mock disapproval. He was referring to the brown Bess musket that had only recently been replaced with a new, more powerful Minier rifle. Now, don't you go getting all excited, old man. At your age, it could be the death of you, Dawson chuckled. I do miss my old Bessie, I'll give you that. But you can't beat getting your hands on a younger model now, can you? Dawson slapped the stock of his Minier rifle. Jack grinned at their tomfoolery, glad his fusiliers had the good spirits to chide and tease one another. Taylor threw a lump of rock-hard biscuit in Dawson's direction. The young fusilier caught it and took a teeth-shattering bite out of it. His grimace of pain set the men off laughing again, and Jack used the moment to move on. A slow and laconic round of applause came from the darkness on the very edge of the light company's lines. Bravo! Slater's voice mocked Jack from the shadows. Trust you to play the tough. Slater had taken to making his own private bivouac, away from the hatred and fear of the company. Now, like a spider crawling from its web, he slunk out of the darkness, his shadowy form huge in the flickering light of the campfires. Instinctively, Jack's hand moved to the handle of his revolver. Slater noticed. Oh, you like to shoot me, would you, Lark? Slater stepped forward, suddenly very close and very threatening. Well, here I am, all on my lonesome. Go ahead, shoot me. Jack was sorely tempted. He looked into Slater's moist brown eyes and felt a surge of hatred so intense it threatened to overwhelm all reason. With an effort, Jack brought his emotions under control. Why don't you just bugger off and desert? We certainly don't bloody want you, Jack hissed. Slater's thick moustache twitched. Damn you, I'm no coward. I'm not frightened of the Russians, and I'm most certainly not frightened of you. But you, now you should be frightened. You should be shitting in your fucking breeches, boy. Jack gritted his teeth and said nothing. You took away my stripes. Slater's voice quivered with emotion, something Jack had never expected the brute of a man to reveal. It was like hearing armour crack. Oh, I thought about peaching on you, telling the whole world what a fraud you are, your by-blow of a doxy. Slater went on quietly and evenly, his emotion back under control. But then I figured, why give the army the bother of dealing with you when I could get so much pleasure out of doing it myself? He licked his lips. You better take care. There's no knowing what could happen in the heat of battle. Why... I hear some officers have been hit in the back, shot by their own men, can you believe? Slater stepped back, and without a word, Jack turned away towards the nearest fire 
as if the heat of its flames could melt the chill that gripped him. Chapter 26 Few men were woken by the harsh notes of the Ravalli. Many were already up and about, abhorring the idea of wasting what could be their last living hours in sleep. The quiet murmur of voices could be heard throughout the army, some in conversation with their fellows, others in prayer, even those most vehement atheists returning to the comforting words of religion. The sun rose lethargically, as if it too was unwilling to start the day. The morning was chilly, the men in their uniforms damp from the heavy dew. Fires were coaxed into life, and the men breakfasted on salt pork and biscuit. Then it was time to form up. By 6.30 the men stood ready in their ranks, waiting for the command to march. Their coats steamed gently under the climbing sun. Horses pawed at the ground and flicked their tails. The men fidgeted and waited. By 7.30 there was still no order to advance. Exasperated officers decided enough was enough and ordered their men to sit. The men sank gratefully to the ground, and the officers gathered to vent their frustration at the maddening delay and the incompetence of their seniors. Digby Brown! The lieutenant heard his captain's loud summons and reluctantly left the circle of subalterns. Already he was sweating profusely, his thin whiskers slick from the steady stream that ran down from underneath his shako. Yes, sir. Nothing's going to happen for a while, so I'm of a mind to see what lies ahead. I'm leaving you in charge of the company. I'll return should the generals condescend to present us with orders to advance. Very good, sir. Digby Brown licked his lips nervously as he risked a request. Would you mind if I came with you? Yes, I would. Jack wanted to get away from the cloying attention of his fellow officers. Taking Digby Brown with him would be as bad as joining in one of their pointless discussions. Digby Brown's shoulders slumped at the unkind reply. Very good, sir. Any other commands? No. Stay with the men and send someone to me if I'm needed. Jack made to leave. I think I might just about be able to manage that, sir. Digby Brown's words stopped Jack in his tracks. It's just the task for a hopeless lieutenant. What on earth do you mean by that? Jack snapped. Well, it's clear you don't like me. You treat me like something you've just trod in. I have no idea what you mean. Jack could see the emotion in his junior officer's face, and it brought him up short. Truly? Digby Brown's eyes glistened. You never have a good word to say to me. You treat me like a fool. I don't think you're a fool, except when you come up with daft notions like this. With respect, sir, I disagree. I've tried my best to help you, yet whatever I do, you show me nothing but scorn and derision. It's grossly unfair. Listen, Digby Brown, this is neither the time nor the place for this. I think it is exactly the time, sir. There may not be an another chance to speak plainly. The young lieutenant paled at the thought of his own mortality. Well, consider your views aired and noted. Your function in my company is to assist me as I see fit. If that is unsatisfactory to you, then I can arrange for you to be assigned elsewhere. For God's sake, man, we're about to go into battle. This is not the time for a fit of the vapours. Digby Brown's shoulders slumped, and he lowered his head, his spark of righteous anger extinguished by Jack's damning words. The sight of the crestfallen officer pricked Jack's conscience. Look here, Digby Brown. I need you to help me. Do you understand? You need me, sir. I thought you couldn't stand the sight of me. Grow up, man. Of course I need you. I can't do everything myself. The men will look to both of us to show them what is expected of them. For better or worse, we are their officers, and it's up to us to live up to their expectations. Yes, sir. Digby Brown's head lifted. 
I would like to apologise for my outburst. Now you're being a damn fool. Jack clapped Digby Brown on the shoulder. He knew he had treated his lieutenant harshly. He had used the young officer as an undeserving scapegoat for all his loathing towards the officer class. He saw now how his treatment had affected Digby Brown, and for that he did feel a pang of remorse. He had not set out to be such a bastard. You have all the makings of a fine officer, Jack told him. Never let anyone tell you different. Now, he summoned a wry smile. Get to your bloody duties before I change my mind. Yes, sir. Digby Brown glowed with delight, the unexpected praise helping to settle the fear that sat heavily in his stomach. And thank you, sir. Jack turned and made his way up the small hillock a few hundred yards in front of the fusilier's position. At the top, he pulled up handfuls of heather and weeds to make a cushion that would spare his backside direct contact with the damp ground. Then he turned his attention on the panorama that stretched towards the southern horizon. Directly to the south was a ridge, and it was carpeted with thousands upon thousands of Russian infantry. Unlike the Allied army, the enemy had yet to form up. Sunlight glinted on the infantry's neatly piled arms and reflected off the hundreds of pieces of artillery whose iron barrels were aimed down the slope towards the Alma River. Jack slowly panned along the enemy's position, Sloan's precious field glasses bringing the Russian men sharply into focus. He watched intrigued as individual soldiers wandered down to a thick band of vegetation that lined the banks of the river. He picked out one scrawny Russian conscript, whom he handed down to where a thick clump of bushes would screen him from his fellows. The Russian had not reckoned on being observed from far away to the north, and Jack had a clear view as he dropped his thick grey trousers and squatted down onto his haunches. Jack held the man in view. He counted the seconds, deciding that if the Russian was still emptying his bowels after the count of thirty, then Slater would die that day. Jack knew it was superstitious nonsense, but he could not help feeling hopeful as he reached twenty. At the count of twenty-seven, the Russian soldier abruptly stood up and hoisted his trousers over his skinny shanks. Jack swore loudly. Annoyed at his own stupidity, he turned away from observing the Russian line. He shuffled round on his scratchy seat so he could observe the preparations of his own side. The sight of the massed ranks of the Allied army astounded him. It stretched for miles. The Allied force was far greater than even the huge number he'd observed in the Russian lines. Officers galloped between the formations, full of activity despite the fact that the army was sprawled immobile on the ground. To the rear, the last of the ammunition wagons made their way forward, harried by mounted officers who bellowed at the cart drivers to make swifter progress. Around the Bulganak, the army's pioneers wielded shovels to level the riverbanks and make the passage across the river as easy as possible for the thousands of infantrymen, cavalry, artillery and supply troops that would have to cross its winding course. The sound of bugles and drums reached Jack's hillock. The French army was stirring into life far away on the right flank of the Allied force, once again, it appeared that the French were ready to fight while their British allies still laboured in their preparations. Jack watched the first French brigade start their advance towards the steep cliffs that protected the Russian general's left flank. Perhaps the French commander, Saint Arnaud, was as tired of waiting for the British generals as their own army was. The movement seemed to spur the British high command to life, a fresh flurry of staff officers left the clump of generals at the heart of the British formation and raced their horses through the massed ranks of the army, a new urgency in their hurried passage. As Jack watched through his field glasses, the massive columns of infantrymen slowly rose to their feet and small clusters of officers broke up and returned to their commands. It was now mid-morning, but at last the British army was about to advance. Chapter 27 The Alma was a river in name only. In most places, the local Tatar children could happily splash across from bank to bank, 
their passage barely troubled by the shallow water. In places, the river bent and twisted back on itself, forming deeper, more forbidding eddies and dark pools, but even the laziest of peasants could divert around them with little effort. What minor inconvenience the river created could be avoided altogether via a single stone bridge that had stood for centuries. The old post road it carried made its way through the centre of the valley, heading in a roundabout way towards the great naval base at Sevastopol. The local Tatars only bothered to use the bridge when they needed to transport the harvest in their rickety Arabas cars to the larger towns. The small villages called the River Valley home. The inhabitants of Berliuk and Almatamak spent most of their lives within the confines of the valley, the only visitor to their remote homes, the local mullah who taught the children the stories of the Quran and who fought to save their parents' souls from the few temptations of the flesh that could be found in such remote villages. Away from the river, the ground was barren, the wide expanse of grasslands left uncultivated, good for little more than grazing for the Tartars' flocks of sheep and herd of cattle. Scattered across the vast grassland stood ancient piles of stones. Local legend spoke of hidden treasure buried under the carefully constructed piles, yet no villager had ever summoned enough courage to disturb the work of their ancestors. A terrible black horse was said to guard the treasure, keeping it safe through the centuries. The legend of the black horse could not keep the valley safe from the violation of war. The bridge and shallow river were of enough strategic value to tempt the Russian army away from the secure defences of Sevastopol, thrusting thousands of soldiers into the lives of the local Tatars. They found themselves evicted from their villages, their herds requisitioned to feed the gargantuan host, their vineyards and orchards plundered. The lives of a few hundred Tatar peasants were of no consequence in the mighty struggle to secure victory over the invading armies of the British, French and Turkish governments. For Prince Menchikov, the Russian commander, the terrain around the Alma River was a defender's paradise. To the west, where the land met the sea, huge cliffs soared up from the coast 150 feet high and thought to be impassable to the invading army and most especially to their cumbersome artillery. These massive natural buttresses gave way to a long ridge that stretched inland for many miles along the southern bank of the Alma before it abruptly terminated in a high pinnacle that jutted out into the open plains to the east. The ridge's rugged slopes led down to the southern bank of the Alma. Here, the river bank was at its highest and most formidable in many places several feet above the slow-moving water. The natural folds in the ground along the slope formed a succession of natural terraces which were perfect for positioning defensive infantry and artillery. Opposite, on the north side of the river, the ground was open and sloped gently down to the Alma. It offered no shelter and no cover. It was an attacker's nightmare. Menshikov would not, however, rely on the terrain alone to win him victory. The Allied army might have been allowed to land on Russian soil unmolested, but their slow advance had given the Russian general ample time in which to pick his ground and strengthen the position he had chosen. The two villages were cleared, the houses and mud walls demolished, denying the attackers cover. Huge bundles of straw were positioned in the ruins, ready to be fired to hamper any troops advancing through the debris. All cover near the river banks was uprooted or burnt, the many trees cut down and taken away. The enemy was to be given nowhere to hide, no place where they could shelter from the lethal storm that Menshikov intended to bring down against them. Artillery officers paced the distances and measured ranges. They laid down markers for the gunners, calculated overlapping fields of fire to maximise the power of the massed artillery batteries. The Russians applied the rules of mathematics and physics to the business of administering death. Nothing would be left to chance. Two great earthworks were constructed on the heights on the Russian side of the river. The largest, the Great Redoubt, had a breastwork four feet high, fashioned from huge tree trunks. 
Hundreds of sandbags and wide wicker gabions packed full of earth would protect the defenders from the enemy fire. Crude embrasures had been hacked out of the southern face, creating openings for a dozen guns which could be brought to bear on any attacker coming across the river. Further to the east, a second redoubt was constructed to protect the open flank, with another battery of guns sighted behind its protective barricade. Menchikov's chosen position ran for six miles from the coast to the smaller redoubt. 40,000 Russian soldiers, hundreds of pieces of artillery and thousands of cavalry waited for the invading army to arrive. Menshikov was confident. The invaders could send wave after wave of men to try to breach his mighty defences. None would get through. The British, French and Turkish soldiers would be massacred. Menshikov boasted to all who would listen that he could not be defeated. Such was his confidence that the people of Sevastopol journeyed along the coast to watch the might of Britain and France waste its strength against Menshikov's defences. The invasion was reduced to entertainment, a pleasing diversion for the good ladies and gentlemen of Sevastopol to observe in safety. Good Lord, now why are we stopping? The good Lord is the best person to ask, Mr Digby Brown. Perhaps Raglan thinks we are too fatigued to continue. Oh, the man is a damn fool. Jack growled in frustration as the fusiliers were ordered to come to yet another maddening halt. Sir! Jack laughed at Digby Brown's reaction. I apologise. I really should learn to moderate my language. Thank you, sir. But even you, Mr Digby Brown, must admit that this is yet another total balls-up. Yes, sir. Jack smiled and clapped his subaltern on the shoulder. Good fellow, we'll make a radical of you yet. I hope not, sir. Lieutenant Thomas made his way over to join them. All along the column, bad-tempered officers gathered to discuss this latest infuriating delay. The King's Royal Fusiliers marched in the centre of the Light Division's column, too far from the front to benefit from the clean breeze that swept across open plain from the sea only a few miles to the west. Instead, they were forced to march in the midst of the choking cloud of dust that was kicked up by the boots of those further ahead. Their throats were clogged with dust, they were thirsty and their tempers were fraying at the exasperating regularity with which the column came to a halt. The King's Royal Fusiliers served the 1st Fusilier Brigade alongside the 7th Royal Fusiliers and the 23rd Royal Welsh Fusiliers. The brigade was commanded by Major General William Codrington, and it was one of the two brigades that formed the Light Division. Raglan's plan was simple. Four divisions would attack the Russian position. They would cross the river directly in front of the huge Russian army, precisely where they were strongest. The divisions would form up in two long lines stretching from west to east. The Light Division would fight on the left of the front line, with the 2nd Division under Major General de Lacey Evans on the right. The 1st Division, commanded by the Queen's cousin, the Duke of Cambridge, would follow the Light Division, while the 3rd Division, commanded by Sir Richard England, would be behind the 2nd Division. Four divisions, 25 battalions, nigh on 20,000 redcoats. The Light Company's three officers stood together in companionable silence as each contemplated the enemy force. The Fusiliers had been ordered to halt, yet again on a low-crested rise two miles short of the Alma River. The raised ground gave them a clear view of the Russian position. It stretched for miles across the higher ground to the south of the Alma. Even from such a distance, the difficulties facing the attackers were obvious. The Redcoats would be marching into a corridor of death. I must say, th there does seem to be an awful lot of them. Lieutenant Thomas broke the silence, his face pale, his voice cracking as he spoke, the squeak of adolescence betraying his youth. Jack looked at his junior officer's wan expression and wondered what kind of country took their young boys from school and sent them to fight thousands of miles from home. Don't concern yourself about them, Thomas. Our job is to look after the men. Let the generals worry about the enemy. Besides, we outnumber them. Digby Brown sought to add to his captain's reassurance. We have to share those Ruskies with the French and the Turks. 
I hope there are enough to go round. Jack turned away from the formidable Russian host so that he was facing his two subalterns. Today is not about fulfilling any childish dreams you may have of chasing glory. I want you to concentrate on bringing as many of our men out of here as possible. And whatever we face, we face it together. As a company. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Both subalterns replied firmly and in unison. Good. I'm glad you have learnt not to mumble, Mr Thomas. It's nice to see you making progress at last. The sound of artillery opening fire echoed along the valley. Far away on the right flank, puffs of smoke rose into the still air. The French army had begun its attack in front of the cliffs that formed Menshikov's left flank. The cliffs were a formidable obstacle, and Menshikov had decided that only a thin screen of soldiers was needed to keep the Allies from turning the flank. The bulk of the Russian artillery and infantry was in the centre and on the right flank, where the British infantry waited to begin their own assault. Lieutenant Flowers walked his horse over to join the light company officers. As one of the battalion's field officers, Flowers was required to be mounted, a rather dubious honour since it made him an ideal target for Russian sharpshooters. Flowers sat his horse well, but the bony nag he was riding rather spoiled his fine appearance. The horse stood several hands too small to suit the adjutant's tall frame, its threadbare coat and prominent ribs testifying to its poor condition. "'Goodness me, I'm glad the French are attacking those cliffs and not us,' Flowers observed. "'That they think they can get up there astonishes me.' Jack was pleased to see the adjutant. His two subalterns needed distraction. "'Wouldn't surprise me if the damn frogs believe they can win the battle all on their own,' he said. Still, attacking the flanks, however pointless it may appear, suggests strategy. That perhaps their general has actually thought up a plan? Flowers tugged at the reins of his horse, which had lowered its head to crop at the tufts of grass around its hooves. Are you implying that Lord Raglan has no plan? Jack replied. That... His decision to commit us to a frontal attack against prepared defences after advancing over nearly a mile of open, coverless terrain is somehow lacking in forethought? Flowers yanked hard on the reins of his recalcitrant steed. The horse was determined to feast on the moist grass. I'm sure his thorough reconnaissance led him to conclude that there was no other course of action open to him. His reconnaissance? Jack raised his eyebrows. I must have missed that. Did either of you two happen to notice any cavalrymen out in front? No, sir. An uncomfortable silence followed. In Wellington's time, the British exploring officers had been lauded throughout the army. The intelligence they provided had been vital to the Duke's preparations. For Ragland to have chosen not to send out similar outriders was an appalling indictment of his ability as a general. Flowers tried to lighten the sombre mood. Well, I think I can say my duty to spread gloom and despair is complete. Should you need any more of my encouraging words, then please do not hesitate to summon me. I think we've had all the encouragement we can stomach for the moment. Jack smiled, despite the censure in his words, and he was glad to see his two subalterns relax a little. Flowers turned his head towards the distant sound of battle which had increased in tempo. Perhaps, as you suggested, the French will win the day without our help. Well, that would be nice. As Jack replied, the bugles sounded and the drums rattled. But I rather fancy Raglan has other ideas. All along the British line, the redcoats stirred into life once again. The battalions were ordered to form line, staff officers swarmed around the column as it slowly broke up, and in the measured step of the parade ground the men moved into the new formation to the beat of the drums. The order came to jettison knapsacks, final confirmation that the wait was nearly over. An uneasy lull fell over the troops. The bugles and drums fell silent. The shouts of the sergeants and corporals ceased now that the men stood in line, their spacings regular, the files ordered. The staff orderlies rode back to their commanders, their orders delivered. 
The King's Royal Fusiliers stood in the centre of the Light Division, the 23rd Royal Welsh to their left, the 7th Fusiliers to their right. King's Royal Fusiliers, prepare to load, thundered the battalion Sergeant Major's voice, dispelling the temporary hush. Load! The waiting was over. Chapter 28 King's Royal Fusiliers, battalion will advance, advance. It was a few minutes past noon. To their intense disappointment, the Light Company had been ordered to fight in their main battalion line behind the green jackets of the 95th Rifles. The Light Company were the trained skirmishers in the battalion, used to fighting on their own, strung out in extended order in front of the battalion, screening the dense ranks from the withering fire of the enemy's skirmishers. But instead of advancing with the green jackets, the light company were expected to fire the disciplined volleys of a regular company, adding their rifles to the power of the massed battalion ranks. Jack would have revelled in the opportunity to lead his company forwards on its own, but for reasons he could not fathom, the generals had decided otherwise. The long red line moved forward at the command, each man's heart beating a little faster. In the centre of the battalion line, the drummer boys beat out the time of the march, the young boys barely big enough to carry the huge instruments that hung heavily from the leather bands that held them pressed against their stomachs. To the front of the drummers marched the battalion colours, two huge squares of coloured silk which embodied the battalion's honour and pride. A pair of colour sergeants, armed with ferocious halberds, a weapon that harked back to the days when all fighting was done hand to hand, guarded each colour. The sergeants were there to protect the colours at all costs. They would use their formidable weapons to hack and gut any enemy who tried to steal them. Two young ensigns carried the heavy colours with pride. To be chosen was a distinction, one that would be long remembered and cherished, if they survived. The honour came with a price, for the gaudy squares of silk were certain to draw the fire of enemy sharpshooters. One ensign carried the Queen's colour, an enormous Union Jack, proudly emblazoned with the regimental crest in its centre, the second held aloft the battalion's regimental colour of vibrant blue, with the crossed fusils of the regiment's badge picked out in gold thread. The regiment's battle honours were sewn in the same gold thread, in two columns, one either side of the badge. Each place name was highlighted by a rectangle of blood-red silk, in honour of the fusiliers who had gone before, who had fought and died under the same twin flags. The battle honours read like a chronicle of the British army. Dyke, Corona, Neve, Peninsula, Waterloo, the names resonated with history, and the 600 fusiliers marching towards the massed ranks of the Russian army were about to take their place in it. For the love of God, Fusilier Dawson exclaimed, echoing the sentiments of all the companies the enemy artillery opened fire. Silence in the ranks! Next person to speak will find themselves the proud owner of a new arsehole. Sergeant Baker made his presence felt from his position behind the rear rank. His eyes roved over the company, ready to pounce on any lack of discipline. From his place in the centre of the front rank, Slater laughed at the sergeant's coarse words. He ignored the looks of disgust his fellow redcoats shot his way. He fed on their hatred, nurturing it, savouring it, adding to the bitterness that burned inside him. He felt no trace of fear as the company marched obediently into the barrage of fire, but he was no fool. He knew the danger he faced. Fate was a fickle goddess, but he trusted her to keep him alive to deliver the justice he craved. He had vowed that Jack Lark would meet his own fate today. Lark had dared to cheat his destiny, stealing a life and a place in the world far removed from that allotted to him. He would not cheat death. High in the sky, two black dots emerged from the cloud of smoke that enveloped the lines of Russian cannon. Every fusilier watched anxiously as the shot flew through the air towards them, covering the distance in a heartbeat. 
The round shot smashed into the ground in front of the battalion, gouging a thick channel out of the earth before bouncing back high into the air and over the heads of the men. A ragged cheer erupted from the redcoats, the men finding the breath to hoot their derision. Without breaking step, the redcoats treated the first artillery fire they had ever experienced with gleeful disdain. Fusilier Trotter, Jack singled out one of his men who marched close to Slater. I thought you were the battalion's wicket-keeper. Why didn't you take that one? Too much pace on it, sir. I thought I'd leave it for the long stops in the guards. It was not much of a joke, but the company laughed as if the finest comedian from the Palladium was among them. The Fusiliers marched on, advancing as only the British advanced, devoid of fanfare, stoic and steady, the line moving forward with deadly purpose. Open the ranks, Jack yelled, tracing the pencil-thin trace that marked the path of incoming round shot. The Russian batteries were sending their fire into the advancing red line from all along the enemy position, and one black dot was heading straight for his company. Jack screamed at his men to move, his heart in his mouth as he prayed they were quick enough to get out of its way. The fusiliers in its path scattered. Like an express train roaring through a station, the shot sped through the opening, its horrifying passage startling in its violence. It smashed into the ground behind the company before flying over the heads of the Scots fusiliers who marched directly behind them in the ranks of the 1st Division. The Scottish troops greeted the fusiliers' desperate antics with loud whoops and catcalls of derision, gleefully mocking the undignified display. Sergeant Shepherd manhandled the men back into the ordered ranks, which had continued to move purposefully forward even as their fellows dodged the deadly missile. Jack scanned the sky, ever vigilant for danger aimed at the light company. King's Royal Fusiliers, prepare to halt! Halt! The men had advanced close enough to the burning village of Berliuk to feel the heat. Dirty, grey smoke swirled around the ruined houses. There was no cover for the redcoats, but the smoke screened their movements from the Russian gunners and prevented the use of their range markers so they were forced to shoot blind. But the British troops were simply too numerous to miss completely. Captain Devine's third company was hit, the round shot ploughing through a file of redcoats in a gory shower of bone and blood. The fusiliers stood silent and still, stoic as two of their fellows were reduced to pathetic, twisted corpses in the blink of an eye. Colonel Morris left his place in the centre of the battalion, urging his huge black horse forward. Lie down! Lie down! He rode along the front of the fusiliers' line, waving his hat over his head to emphasise the urgent order. Good fellows! It won't be long now. Well done, my boys! Morris turned his horse when he reached the battalion's left flank, nodding a friendly greeting to Jack as he did so. He trotted easily back along the front of his battalion, repeating words of comfort, showing himself to his men, letting them see that he shared their danger. The men lay on the ground, the heat from the sun and the burning village making them sweat in their thick red jackets. Their officers remained on their feet, stoically standing in their allotted positions, setting an example to their men, despite the terror fluttering in their bellies. It was impossible for the redcoats to avoid the enemy fire now they were lying down, but it was also harder for the Russian gunners to hit them. Most of the round shot bounced harmlessly over the prostrate soldiers, wasting their power on the clammy soil which erupted in spectacular fountains of earth. Volley after volley hammered across the plain. The British soldiers lay on the ground beneath the cannonade and endured as best they could, many seeking solace in their God, their lips moving in silent prayers for deliverance. There was nothing else to be done. 